It's the new year, almost. It's New Year's Eve, and we are doing our special here on Infinity Rewatch. I am Andrew Fantasia. What's up, everybody? And I'm Ryan J. Whitehead. And oh boy, do we have an episode for you. Uh, I know we're all uh, exhausted from the holidays. We are all wiped. You can probably tell from my voice that I am wiped, but I'm going to come talk to you guys anyway because we have something special that we've been planning for a long time ryan we're ranking the mcu we're doing it we're ranking the mcu thus far thus far um i think we need to just lay out a couple things or Mm -hmm. at least i need to lay out one thing uh we were able to secure a list from my brother who's who's definitely someone who needs to be on this show at some point yeah um and he has not surprisingly not seen song chi and eternals yet but it's because he has a kid so he can't you know keep up with the the constant barrage of of new things uh that (laughs) that marvel keeps producing so so he i think his list is is as important to be a part of what's about to happen uh but for the record it may have it may have affected some things because he hasn't seen song chi or eternals Right. And that when you told me that he hadn't seen them, I had the same reaction. I was like, wait, he hasn't? And then I was like, wait, he's also a father. So that yeah, makes yes. sense. He, he's also a dad. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it was crazy because like, yeah, like he he's definitely would not miss these things, like would not miss these things. But it just goes to show you, you know, when you have a kid, it, it, kids are big, uh, big responsibilities and time consumers. So. <laughs> They yeah, are. so uh so but we all love charlotte and she's wonderful and um and yeah so my brother so just just want to throw that out there i'm i'm sure song chi give like a 10 out of 10 but i'm curious as to if you would love or hate eternals so eternals uh i feel like it's a criminally underrated movie and we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it but uh mm-hmm. what i ended up doing for because there were a few people um there was nick and then there was also brock and james had not seen eternals as well and i think they had not seen shang chi or something but for any time there was a movie somebody had not seen is i i didn't put it at the bottom of their list but i put it uh on the the average i calculated the average based on what everybody else gave it right and then i i stuck it in their list in that respect so uh Um, okay it's uh i i tried to give those unwatched movies as fair a shot as we could here um let me just say off the top before we begin that i have never had so much fun doing math (laughs) (laughs) i believe it i believe it it is the most i have ever looked forward to adding numbers and multiplying things it is i i could do one of these every year this is uh this was what math was meant for i think back in ancient greece when pythagoras and all those people were putting together their numbers they were like you know one day there's going to be a marvel cinematic universe and people are going to want to know what ranking they give to it so we need to come up with this number system now so that 2800 years from now andrew can figure that out so thank yeah. you ancient grecians for throwing this all together for me um now, as usually happens, Ryan, I don't know if you've ever seen when we do uh, on, on Rebel Scum, we do the ranking Star Wars as well uh, yeah. every New Year. And every once in a while, not it's not common, but every once in a while we get a tie where two of the movies score the same thing. Actually, I should clarify for people listening how we scored this. So essentially, we got six lists. We got you, me, Nick, Brock, James, and Rob. Um, we were going to get Anna's list, but unfortunately Anna's work was just too crazy for the holidays. It's understandable. She just, she wasn't able to make one. Uh, so I apologize. The list is a bit of a sausage fest, but we all know Anna's here in spirit and we all know Eternals is in last place for her because she has made that. <laughs> um, yeah. so I, I got those lists and then what I did was I just, uh, I sort of aggregated everybody's positions. So let's say Captain America Civil War was number five on everybody's list. So that's six lists. So I would go five plus five plus five plus five plus five plus five. And then that would be the total. And then I would add up the totals. And then whichever movie had the lowest number ended up being our most beloved number one ranked MC thing, etc. Oh, this is going to be so cool. I'm it so is. excited. <laughs> it is so cool. Let me, let, me, uh, let me get two predictions off you, Ryan, before we start. I'm going to ask you to predict how many ties do you think we had? 
And which movie do you think ended up in last place? Okay. For me, I'm going to say, uh, for me, I'm going to say how many ties we had. I'm going to say at least four. At least four. I was going to go with three. I'm like, that's a good prime number. It's a safe number. But I'm like, no, maybe I'll throw in one extra. But four are going to be at least in the same. And also, we have to point out two more things. One, Spider-Man No Way Home wasn't in this list. Correct. Yeah. And two, uh, Disney Plus shows are not in this list. Yeah. Just the motion okay. pictures. <clears throat> Just the motion pictures. So I'm going to say four tied. And uh, the bottom one, it's going to be a toss-up. But I'm, I'm going to say probably Iron Man 3 is going to be the bottom. All right. Well. I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> We actually ended up having three ties. Your gut was correct. We had three ties. Oh, no! I was greedy. I was greedy. Now, same, here's the, same, same. the interesting thing with the ties is I was like, okay, if I end up with a tie, what I'm going to do to break the tie is I will, like, let's say there's a tie between Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp. What I would do is I would go through everybody's list and I would find how, which of those two was above the other more often. Right, okay. and that's how I would break the tie. I was only able to break one of the three ties with that method. Otherwise, for the other two, it was both exactly neck and neck again. <laughs> so we'll we'll get there when we get there. But I just thought that was interesting how close those ended up being. As for your guess right. for the twenty sixth bottom ranked movie, your guess was Iron Man three. You're a wise man, sir, because that's exactly what it was. With a oh, score of yes. 129 points, Iron Man 3 came in last place. Uh, I would not have guessed it was going to be Iron Man 3. Really? Yeah, I would what have did gone. You think? Where did you think this was going to go? I would have gone for uh, a Thor myself. Uh, I also would have, me and another person, Rob, we both had uh, Captain Marvel at the bottom of our lists. So I thought Ooh. that uh, it might end up being pretty close to the bottom. But no, Iron Man 3, understandable, right? What what do you think it belongs here? Like belongs on the list? or On, on, the, bo <laughs> on the bottom of the list. Uh, I think yes, because, you know, at that time with Iron Man movies, you know, first of all, the first Iron Man set such a bar. Like, yeah. it, it literally, you know, it, I, I always said it with the first Iron Man. Once you saw the first Iron Man, once the first Iron Man came out, you know what superhero movies should be. So you have that, you have that bar set for you. And, and at that point, the, there's no more excuses after Iron Man. Because if you do it right once, then you know at that point, you should be able to go further. But Iron Man 3 still proved to me that they still had a little bit to learn um, in terms of experimenting and how to introduce like, you know, how to introduce like adapted formulas where they would change like characters a little bit and everything. Mm -hmm. So Iron Man 3 was the first to kind of actually kind of not go the way it should have. And I think there and it also could if you look at the history of that movie, uh, Favreau was even against the idea of bringing in Mandarin. He just thought it was the, the worst, the absolute worst idea because he, he knew it was too big of a character to throw in at this point. And I agree. And so that the, the politics of that also just screamed like, yeah, they, they learned what not to do. And that's why I think it absolutely deserves to be where it is, because if MCU has taught us anything is that you need to have a good villain and the, and the villain has to have a really good story that 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 brings that, that has to be relevant to what's going on so um yeah i they totally think it does belong there yeah i i don't mind that they tried to have this crazy twist and throw everybody for a loop it's just you're right you need to have a good villain and when the fake villain you gave us is a million times more interesting and scary than what we ended up getting which is just random military folks with like sunlight eyes and guy pierce with breathing fire it's like oh wow that's 
that was the trade-off, right? So I totally understand that um, this would disappoint a lot of people. Um, I didn't have it high on my list, but I didn't have it this low either. I think Iron Man 3 is fine-ish. Um, so I guess the uh, the rest of the other five lists really had it lower because it was uh, it was quite... Um, it was quite a disappointing thing on everybody's uh, everybody's rankings. Is people were not uh, not feeling the Iron Man three love. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know what I think could have saved this movie, Modok. I, again, I, Modok, I believe, is a very very difficult character to do. So I yeah, I don't think Modok would have saved that movie either. <laughs> <laughs> I I do th- I I see why you would say Modok actually if you're being serious because they're talking about aim like it's it's an yeah. aim directed directed enemy uh and and they just deviate and then throw in mandarin out of all things <laughs> so I see why you say that on a serious tone but I don't know if Modok is is enough i would say i would say that if you were to do modok you would do what the video game the marvel avengers game did and bring in before he's modok bring in the character before he's modok Ooh, i've never seen that and then and then have him be the villain and then in the end you tease the idea that he becomes modok i could get on board with that yeah yeah uh all right so that was number 26 number 25 uh, i'm sure this surprises nobody Thor the Dark World. Not surprised there either. No. <laughs> um, no, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Uh, I think that I think that with Thor Dark World, again, villain issue right out of the gate. Mistakes were made. Uh, overall, <laughs> though, I, I don't think it... I don't know. I don't think it needs to be that low, personally, but... Like I maybe put maybe put it one or two points higher, but I don't know what would go under it to be honest with you. So it kind of makes sense why it is where it is. But what they did right was the aesthetic was beautiful. I think this was one of the the best attempts at Thor becoming more comic book looking and 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 yet feeling a little <laughs> more real and fun. Um, and there were some fun moments in that movie, but again, if the villain's not there, then and I feel really bad for that actor because he's a good actor. And they really gave, they really did him dirty with that movie. He <laughs> yeah, is both Malekith and Curse are both great actors, and they just got. Uh, uh, and it's when I see every time I see pictures of what Curse and Malekith are supposed to look like, I can't help but think of the Thor two we could have gotten, the, you know, the one that could have been had had this been Phase three, you know, and yes. had, had had they they had that the sense of costume design and the sense of bravery that they didn't have in phases one and two, because I think I could be wrong, but I think Perlmutter was still calling a lot of shots or somebody, somebody who was mm-hmm. not Feige was still calling a lot of shots. And then after phase two, they got rid of that somebody, whoever it was, and you can see the difference. Uh, so I, I always wonder what this movie could have been like. Uh, and I'm constantly, constantly in my head, flip-flopping between which of these I like better, this or Thor 1. Um, because they're they're both good for certain reasons to me and they're both bad for certain reasons to me. Uh, so I'm, I feel like I should watch those two again, back to back, and try to make a judgment call. Um, do you remember where you had them on your list? Like which one was higher? Uh, I, can, I can pull up my list uh, if you give me two seconds here. Um... I think Thor Dark World actually ranked roughly around the area where where it was. Um, oh. Just let me double check. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm pretty sure because like, again, Thor, Thor one, you have to if I, honestly, and I feel bad for saying this because I love I love Natalie Portman. I think she's wonderful. And I can't wait to see what they're going to do with her in Thor Love and Thunder. But I gotta say, like, I I have to say that um, if if it wasn't for Natalie's character in the first one, that movie could still be pretty much the same, and it would be infinitely better, just because of the flow. Yeah. Like, if you literally look at all Thor's scenes, 
like with Loki and 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 Thor's journey in that film, it's amazing. It's it, I love that story. Like the one of the best moments for me was when he couldn't pick up the hammer. And it was, yes. it was such a broken moment of this character and the scream he does. And like, you just feel that moment. But for some reason, every time the scene goes to Natalie and friends and like this kind of Scooby-Doo experience, um, it, it breaks the movie's flow for me. And like, you have like, arguably the be- one of the best villains of the MCU and the story is amazing. And for, and honestly, I honestly think they should have kept Natalie as like a, a paramedic or something because it still would have played into the story of Thor learning humility and like, you know, seeing people that aren't powered fighting for a cause and fighting yeah. and learning what that cause is all about and learning when not to fight and all this stuff. So for some reason, her like science and like trying to explain everything, it, I don't know, like it's uh, it. it it just I, that's why I say like it hurts me to say that Natalie Portman's character and it's not even Natalie Portman. It's the way her character was written broke broke that story a little bit. But if you take that away and you literally look at all Thor scenes, it's it's amazing. It's a great movie. I agree with that. And I mean, like the the next one on our list, number 24 is four. So mm. we can kind of oh, wow. see these yeah. two together. And now they, uh, Thor and Thor the Dark World was one of our three ties. But thankfully, it was the only tie I was able to break. Um, just more people had Thor higher on their list than they had Dark World. So Thor beat it just by that much. Uh, mm. And I, I agree. I feel like with Thor 1, you've got a beautiful story. Um, you've got costume design that made me melt i was so happy with how thor and loki and odin's costumes looked they nailed them um and like it was everything you could want and then it had that nice little touch that i love when a marvel movie does where even though this is a movie about character x we're gonna throw in a little cameo from character q just for funsies and like in comes hawkeye right like i i thought that was just such i love when the mcu does that but then you get this Jane Foster stuff where the whole movie, it's just like they do her such a disservice because Natalie Portman's a, a really good actress, but the whole movie, she's just sitting around there and, and seeing Thor and being like, he sure is pretty. And I'm like, really? Like, I know Thor is supposed to be super hot, but like, can we give this lady something more to do? Like, um, the- like well, like, and like her story would have worked for me if she was always questioning whether he's like just crazy or he actually belongs to some like there's something more to him, right? Yes. Because then it still relates to that thing. And they even they were even shallow with that. They're like they did that scene <clears throat> once. Like they didn't even like they're just like, I don't know he's crazy. I don't know if he's crazy, but clearly he's a part of the science thing that I'm working on. And that's the that's the thing. And it's like, no, the story I want to see is like, I don't know if he's crazy. Or like there is something about him that tells me there's more to life or something like that. Like, I don't even know how to describe it, but, um, but yeah, like I, I, I agree. Like it's, I was, I was getting a little tired of, it's kind of like, why is the rum gone joke of like, Oh, he's so dreamy. Oh, he's so dreamy. Oh, he's so hot. I, I hate you, but you're so hot. And it's just like, I get it. <laughs> like I get the joke. It's funny. The first two times you do it, but three times you're pushing it and and then four times why just why um but yeah like one of my favorite scenes with her is is when she watches him literally take down the shield depot because that's just so fun to to watch and like uh it's just fun to see her go like i don't know if i'm gonna come back from this and like it's that to me was funny but i actually i got my list out now I'm, i'm all prepared and thor actually did rank 25th for me um and but Thor ranked a little higher than I thought I, I thought I did. But, and I, I think that's, the, that's the reason why is that um, Thor, the first one, if you just look at all Thor scenes and the reason, and the fact that they introduced Loki um, it's, it is a better film. Yeah. It's, it's a, a better world building film than dark world. Mm-hmm. I think um, yeah. like the dark elves, who cares? <laughs> like that was how many movies ago who like, what difference have, has their existence made? Um, so that's, uh, that's not something that 
I, I don't think we'll ever go back to. I don't think we'll ever see Curse and Malekith again. And for me, nothing can make a movie crash and burn more than an unearned romance. No, nothing That's brings so well said. Back. Like it's Oh it, man, that is well said, sir. Like <laughs> thank that. you. And when uh when Natalie starts making the goo goo eyes at Thor, it uh it really takes a movie that could have been fun and interesting and just turns it too much into just a cheese factory. And I think that could have been easily avoided with just some more careful writing, but what do I know, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh so that is the thors the first two thors anyway uh spoilers it's going to be a while before we get to thor 3 (laughs) number 23 is miss captain marvel not surprised captain marvel is an awkward honestly i need to i need to watch that movie a couple times i did watch it recently um but it's it's a weird movie it's all i can say is it's weird um it dem- like the trailer demonstrates a lot of promise mm-hmm. um and i think the whole memory loss approach could have worked i think it really could have uh because the beginning when they're dissecting her mind this with the scrolls that's a great that's a great scene it is fun it is a fun scene um but there's so much confusion like all I know is like the scrolls are running from the Kree because they're bullies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not, I'm not sure if I buy that. Um, but I mean, at the same time, okay, let's say I buy that. And then, and then Bree's memories are so messed up that she assumes that she was rescued by the Kree. Doesn't know why. And, and now she's just blindly following orders when she never did in the military <laughs> uh she's just excited to serve and she you know and so that kind of falls flat for me um do i think i do i think brie larson should continue to play captain marvel absolutely i think i just think much like other characters it's just a matter of situation and writing man like i think that i just don't think the directors and the writers just knew what to do with her and and bring her in with some sort of relevance you know what i mean yeah um so do i like what they could do with the kree absolutely i think we're not done with the kree yet i think there's a lot a lot more you can do with the kree i think the problem is is they didn't give scrolls enough backstory to give us enough reason to understand their problem (laughs) uh and then have this weird heartfelt disney moment near the end um for him to find his family and all this stuff do I love the Skrulls? Do I love Talos? 100%. I love Talos. He's, he's a wicked character. Uh, do I love Captain Marvel kind of going to a secret shield bunker and all that part? Like her hanging out with Nick Fury? Love all that stuff too. Um, but I, I kind of like the way you said it earlier, but like this is kind of an unearned character in a weird way. Like it's, it's this is a, we don't, I don't, and especially with Captain Marvel, like she, she, she has no reason to be involved in the MCU yet. Like literally no reason aside from Thanos, which is kind of shoehorned in later on with the Avengers, right? Like with Nick Fury disappearing and all of a sudden, you know, Thanos is bad. And now she knows Thanos is like the reason why she can't see Nick Fury when she could easily like revisit way before that happens. Yeah. And she just so starts saving the world. So, the so the, I 100% agree that Captain Marvel should be there uh, where she is. I think there's a lot more. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to make her character feel relevant and big and and great. Like how how can the Guardians of the Galaxy have more relevance and more importance than Captain Marvel? Yeah, <laughs> like you know what I mean, like. Point. That like, is a really good point. Like that's what blows my mind is like Captain Marvel literally works so closely with the Avengers and yet I feel more I feel that the Guardians <laughs> have way more relevance. Yeah. Um it's it's tricky with this. Like I had this at the bottom of my list. Um I don't hate it. It's just something had to be at the bottom and that ended up going there. Um I agree that it's 
very hard to write for this character. Uh, she's the Superman of the MCU in terms of power scaling. It's really hard to write for Superman. It's yeah. got to be really hard to write for Captain Marvel too. Uh, now, I, I, I feel like Brie Larson is awesome at it. And I feel like the character is awesome and the character deserves better. Mm-hmm. So I want to see them take her to new heights and new and exciting stories. I just like, found yeah, that. I want her to go higher, further, faster. Like I want her yeah. to do that. Do yeah. what the poster says. Don't make, <laughs> don't, don't make the poster a lie. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I think that the two things that made this fall for me were, uh, first of all, I find her pocket of the MCU just very, very bland. The, the Kree are, they're boring. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I find them so boring. They're just military aliens with, with guns. And like, there's literally every other world set up by every other MCU movie has more interesting, colorful things to show me. Um, and then I think that there was a misguided attempt by the writers um, to infuse the movie, especially towards the end where she's fighting Yon rog They infuse those like the final climax with a lot of like how do i put this like a lot of yeah she's standing up to them like women can do anything right and it's like but that's not the moral of this movie the moral of this movie is not a, a gender thing the moral of this movie is you just have this great character and we explore what she does and who she is and everything uh there was never a point in the movie throughout its entirety where Captain Marvel was at a disadvantage because she was a woman. That never yeah. came into play. If if Yon Rog had been like uh, disrespectful towards her or like put her in a lower military position because of her gender or whatever, or like maybe I could see that that's a story of her like fighting that. But mm-hmm. no, she was she was recruited into the Kree. She became a high ranking officer. Um, even the leader of the Kree, the Supreme intelligence takes the form of a woman, her, her, uh, superior officer when she was on earth was that same woman was Glenn Close's character. So, uh, or whoever that was, who was playing her leader, I can't remember. Um, mm. so there was never a sense in this movie that the male characters were just dis- being disrespectful or being unfair to the female characters. So at the end, when she's standing up and she's like, I don't have to take, like, I, I'm, I'm a woman, I can do it. Like, that message, again, is unearned because that's not what this movie was about. They just threw in this last minute thing of like, yeah, girls can do anything. It's like, yeah, we know. You've shown us for two hours now that girls can do anything. We have seen lots of women do awesome things in this movie. That's not the moral here. So I think that they got misguided uh, and, and they, they tried to sell a climax to a movie we hadn't been watching. Mm-hmm. Um, like the only time I can think of in the whole movie where somebody was like sexist towards her was that guy in the parking lot and she puts him in his place like that. So it's yeah. not even like, it, it's never an issue in this movie. Like that's not an issue for Carol Danvers. It's an issue in the real world. Absolutely. But it's the movie never made it an issue for Carol. So for them to stand up at the climax and say, it's an issue for Carol and she's fighting it. It's like, no, it's not. You guys have clearly not made it an issue for Carol. So I, I wish that they had picked the lane. I wish that they had been more specific with either make it an issue for the whole movie or don't and come up with a different way to showcase that climax. Mm -hmm. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and even, even her story that would have, play that arc better which is like her trying to become a fighter pilot they they didn't even give you enough time to let her feel like she's you know doesn't belong or all that stuff they she has one flashback memory where like you know there's a reason why they call it the cockpit like they only give you that one moment and then and then fast forward to oh the only way i could fly is being a part of a test test fighter or, or a uh, special special project program that's led by a woman. Like, I it's so weird. It's a weird film, and the pro and that's it's oh, man. It's it's a movie that could have had so much potential, and 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 I don't know, I don't know where in the <coughs> the viewing process where Kevin because Kevin Feige, I'm pretty sure was well in his 
position at this point oh yeah of being like the ultimate creative director but i don't know where in that where kevin feige's like oh man we should or maybe it was like too far in development he's just like oh we can't can't really do much with this so i don't know i don't know but what i am happy again they introduced the scroll but again the scrolls motivations bizarre um and the kree kree looked badass like you don't need to change much about them like honestly the only thing you need to do is just shape them up to be more of a dictatorship that no one wants and 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 kind of play that out more um and and again you guys want to see a perfect example of what miss marvel should act like is watch avengers earth's mightiest heroes i i i've been convincing fantasia to watch he finally watched it loves it but Miss Marvel's journey in that show is exactly how they should have done it in the movies. And if that's the case, the movie's got a problem. If the cartoon can do it right, the movie's yeah. got a problem. That's I really hope um with the sequel they they really focus on the human side, the human relationship of these three characters we're going to get because I think that's really going to save this Captain Marvel franchise is just um taking take her away from the Cree stuff because it's just I find it so dull. Uh and just have those three characters and they're just it could just be them walking around New York chatting. And I, I would find that more interesting than like, hey, we, we gotta go shoot some rocks on a barren Cree planet. Like, yeah. Give me give me that. Honestly, the biggest thing I hope from the second Mar uh the second um, uh Marvel film is is Rogue takes her power. Ooh, yes. Any uh, any and, rogue makes me happy. So, and uh, <laughs> honestly, I want to see Rogue take her power, and then she become, and then and then you could do the story that we wanted, which was her like being her realizing like um, like being powerless again, having to find uh, having to be in that struggle once again to 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 understand like what she can do and like. And, and, you know, that she could be all she wants to be and go higher, further, faster. Like, like, and that was the other bizarre thing about Captain Marvel. And I'll leave it on this. is like, the, like, the Kree kept telling her, like, oh, you know, and it was a woman that told her this. What we can, what we gave you, we could take away. And it's yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, here's open. Uh, who is it? Nia DaCosta, right? She's making the new one. Yeah. Nia DaCosta. We we have faith in you. Yes, yes, we do. All right. So number twenty-two. I think this is way too low for this movie. Black Widow. Wow, Black Widow ranked that. I put Black Widow much higher on my list than than where it is currently located. Um, I'm a little surprised, honestly. The only mm -hmm. thing, the only grief I have with that movie, the only grief. Is Taskmaster. That's it. That's all I have a problem with. The rest of the movie is amazing. I think it's I, I you know, upon thinking about it, like I'll watch it again and again and again. Like, but the yeah. only problem I have is Taskmaster. <laughs> like, how did it rank so low? I have no clue. I loved Black Widow. I think I could be wrong, but I think if you take away Spider-Man. Of all the Marvel movies we got this year, I, I have Black Widow the highest. Really? Um, yeah. Where did Black Widow rank for you? Uh, I don't have my list with me. I think I put it like at like 14 or something. Um, I just, I really dig that movie. I love the relationship between Natasha and Yelena. I love that the director made some really cool choices, including having an opening credits. Please, Marvel, don't forget to have opening credits. They make movies better. That is a law. It is a just a law of nature. Opening credits equals better movie. Um, so I'm, I'm just uh, like I just had so much fun with it. I think it hit all the right beats for a Marvel movie, and it did some things we didn't expect, um, which is pretty much all you can ask for in a Marvel film. And then to top it all off it gave this character a great send off. And most importantly, and we discussed this when we covered the episode, it made me appreciate her so much that now I can't watch 
any of the other movies that she's in the same way anymore. Now, yeah. when I'm watching those movies, I'm I'm thinking of her and I'm thinking of what she went through here. And it amplified the rest of those films. Yeah, I wholeheartedly, I, again, I agree. I, but again, the only problem is Taskmaster. And, it, 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 you know, like, oh, honestly, I'm really surprised. I am really surprised Black Widow, Black Widow ranked that low. That is really, oh, that's not cool, man. That is, we did we did something wrong there. Yeah, it's it's sad. And that makes us that makes us a better channel, people. You know, checking out this whole Rebel Scum podcast network here on the detour. Um, you know, we we criticize our own lists. We don't say it's the greatest. Yeah. I just admitted that we have a problem in our own list. <laughs> and it's funny when we were putting this together, I think I mentioned on one of our shows, like <clears throat> I was so excited going into this list because unlike Star Wars, there's no clear, you know, with Star Wars, it's very easy to know, you know, what people are going to put first and what people are going to put last. It's just very, it's more well known what people love, majority speaking. So with this, mm-hmm. I was really interested to see the mix up. And we did have very mixed lists, which I loved. Um, but yeah, Black Widow, too low to be here, uh, especially because that means everybody here. Um, ranked the next movie number 21 higher than black widow and that's iron man 2 i well i do love iron man 2 i do as well i do as well (laughs) although it's an unpopular opinion uh (laughs) i i i think that what i loved about iron man 2 is it made the world feel infinitely bigger and i'm talking about itself and made the world feel infinitely bigger. And what's the best part is, is because Tony Stark's ego is so big that it's affecting them. It's affecting them on a government level. And it's so perfect. It's just like, it's, it's recognizing that he is a problem and here's why. And it's, it's the most beautiful thing. Oh my God. Like, I hope, I hope there's a, there's a She-Hulk episode or something where they have like a trial of the Avengers or something like, should the Avengers be, you know, Ooh. praisers? I mean, like we kind of had a missed opportunity in Civil War where there was, there was only a debate amongst themselves. Where I feel like, like even in End of Winter Soldier, when Widow is in front of the Congress and being like, "You need us. You need like I want to see like a good half of the movie on that, like that court case on, and I want more of the Avengers there. I want, I want them all pleading different cases on why." they should or should not exist. And and again, the Marvel game did a really good example of it is like, most of them are like, yeah, you need us. Cause we're, you know, who, what's going to happen if we're not there, you know? And, uh, and Banner was the deciding vote. And he's like, no, we're, we're bad. We're bad people. Like, and it's, it's like vision said, like, you know, there's a causality, right? Like it's, yeah. it's perfect. Um, but, but uh, that's what I love about Iron Man too. is like, is they start to start to poke holes and like, are you a good thing? You know? And I love, I love uh, Justin Hammer's line. You know, he, he claims it's a, um, he claims uh, a, it's a sword that's meant to be a shield. And, right. uh, and I love that line and it's so good. Oh man. Yeah, no, I really, I do love the second one a lot. Do, was the villain strong enough? No, I think the villain had a good backstory, and 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 I think they should have just kept it more crimson dynamo-y as opposed to this kind of whiplash approach. Um, but his backstory was awesome. the The dialogue between them was amazing, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, it was it was a great film. I, I honestly think it was it was awesome. Uh, I love Iron Man 2. Um, I think it's the first MCU film that showed off how colorful and bright these films could be. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the first one that really started expanding the world, like you said, and showing off everything and showing off Nick Fury's corner and bringing in Black Widow and all that. Uh, I always uh, I compare the Iron Man trilogy, the way I feel about it, to the RoboCop trilogy. And that's not just because they're about men who put on suits of armor and fight crime. Um, but it, with, I feel the same way about them where there's two movies that I really, really love. And then a third one that's pretty dumb, but I have a good time when I watch it anyway. That, that's how I, I don't, feel. I don't remember the second RoboCop at all. Is it worth a revisit? 
I thought the first time I watched it, I thought it was better than the first one. And then when I watched it again a couple of years later, I was like, no, first one's better, but this is really, really good still. It's oh, it's it's that. a graffiti movie that hits all the right pleasure centers of the brain. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, I highly recommend RoboCop 2. But uh, yeah, so Iron Man 2 was never um, a negative film for me. I know, I think Isabella and Anna uh, would, would have something to say about that. I think they both uh, would have Iron Man 2 pretty low on their list. But I love it. Do I think it's better than Black Widow? I don't know. It's still, uh, it's still kind of. I don't think it is. I don't think it's better than Black Widow. Um, But it's, it's. I think this is a good-ish spot for it on the list, maybe. Yeah. But uh, I think that that movie gets a bad rap, and I wish more people just kind of looked at Iron Man two again, and realized that it has a scene where Iron Man sits in a giant donut and eats donuts. And you can't find that in any other MCU film. So who's the real winner here? I will, I will like just going back to summarizing the thought is like, it's a perfect world builder. Like I, I totally forgot about the shield angle and the whole thing. It's just, and then you get war machine, like, yes. Ugh. And Justin hammer, come on. Justin it's hammer right. makes up for how lame whiplash was. He, Oh, hundred percent. He totally does. And it like, there's there's a good villain in this and and what's the best part is is the villains aren't the villain it tony stark is his own villain in that and how do you do a movie where the main character is his own problem like that's that's really good i don't know if it's been um announced or confirmed or rumored or anything but i really hope armor wars or ironheart or something brings back justin hammer because he is too good to waste in one movie I mean, Sam, <laughs> Sam Rockwell, man, like he's, he's, he was a perfect, perfect hammer. The scene where he's like, <laughs> when he gets the Iron Man armor and he's working with the military, I, I honestly, I don't know how anyone could have done that scene seriously. Cause oh. like he sells it so well, he's the best arms dealer ever. He's like, Oh, like the, the one, the one where he talks about the, the missile that it's just like creme de la creme and all that. And I love that. He's like, <laughs> it'll bust the bunker that was under the bunker. It makes Ulysses look like it, it looks like it was written in crayon. And then he's like, I call it the X <laughs> one. If that, if that doesn't make it a great film, I don't know what does. <laughs> oh, I, I'm telling you one day on the show, we're going to do a ranking episode on the villains. Spoilers. He's going to be a high on my list. I'm, I'm just putting that out there right now. And yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna end with I'm gonna end with I'm pretty sure Don Cheadle in that scene is laughing at that oh. last <laughs> that last shot of him where his hand is over his mouth. I'm pretty sure he's laughing behind <laughs> behind that mouth because it, or behind that hand because it is what if I were to be reacting to what I just heard, I couldn't I couldn't be serious. Like that was yeah. really funny. Oh, uh, what a what a treasure of an actor. Well, so that was Iron Man 2. Now, in number 20, 20th place on our list of 26 films is The Incredible Hulk. That's fair. That's, that's, I mean, no more or less needs to be said about that movie. Um, except I will say, like, I think Norton had, had a good idea. I think that, I think that they, were, they were really on to something. So much so that I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that Ruffalo kind of still took elements that the first one built off of and still ran with it. Um, I, the villain was perfect uh, and super fun. And again, another world building film, which was really cool to see. And I think the, I don't know. I honestly don't know where that movie went wrong, to be honest with you. I think it was just, I think it was an overall great film. Yeah. I feel the same way. I, and I, I remember I was looking through, the rankings that we give, like our infinity stone rankings. I was looking mm-hmm. through those to help make up my mind. And we both did something that I think was very, um, very wise when we ranked this movie on our podcast, where we gave it two different rankings, one as a Hulk movie and one as an MCU movie. Mm-hmm. And as a Hulk movie, we ranked it pretty high as an MCU movie, not so high. And I think that's where the stigma for lack of a better word, comes from regarding this movie is it's a fantastic hulk movie dare i say an incredible hulk movie um 
but it's it's uh, it's such an outlier. It's such a black sheep. It's really it was really not an MCU movie till Abomination showed up in Shang Chi. If we're being perfectly honest, uh, mm-hmm. like you could have plucked it out and done away with it, and it wouldn't have made a lick of difference. Or rather, um, no, Ross. I forgot about Ross. Uh, they they reuse Ross, but the the fact that it's it just sort of it exists in its own little pocket, and there's never really been any attempt to bring Liv Tyler back into the fold or to kind of explain anything about the plot of that. It, it's just sort of, it exists and it doesn't. It's, it's so weird. Um, they, they acknowledge it almost in the same way that the Netflix daredevil shows and everything would acknowledge the movies, like not directly, but in a roundabout way, as if they're trying to avoid a copyright law or something. So I think that there's a parallel universe where maybe, I don't know, Mark Ruffalo was in this movie and it tied in more and everybody loved it. But as it stands right now, I think this is a good spot for it on the list. Mm -hmm. No, hundred percent. I want to see more Ross. I want to see way more Ross. The, the amount of prejudice and bias that he brings in to, uh, to that movie and just like taking in, take, trying to take the Hulk. And he's like, as far as I'm concerned, that man is the property of the U S military. Like, I want to see more Ross. Just even Widow wasn't enough. I didn't get nowhere near enough Ross in that movie that I thought I was going to get. I just want to get a nice red Ross, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Get him nice and angry. I hope we see him in She-Hulk. I I wish, I hope there's a scene where like he has to testify about Blonsky and, Mm -hmm. and like, and you know, she, she has to say like, no, this person's, you know, bad and all this stuff. And, and Ross comes in, he's like, no, you're, you know, who's the blame for this? Your, your cousin. And like, just like yeah. hitting that, hitting that button of anger. Oh, I want it. I want it. I want it. And like seeing, and then seeing her and she Hulk later. And then Ross being like, see, this is why we need to have our own Hulk, you know, our own nuke. She Hulk is going to take a lot of aspects of the Hulk mythology and bring mm-hmm. it into the forefront. I hope, anyway. Because uh, that's the big pocket that they're missing right now is all the Hulk stuff. So, mm. She-Hulk, you have a lot riding on your burly green shoulders. But we believe in you. Oh, I'm, I am so whole, all in on that show. Yeah. My brother did mention something that does make me a little bit nervous. But I, I'm all in on that show. My all bets, I'm like, literally all the money I have is on that riding on how amazing that show is going to be. What did your brother mention? There's some there's some story things that they're teasing about the show. It's still kind of rumor based, but it kind of makes it feel a bit too quirky uh, mm. for the tone that I think they should go for with the with the Hulk kind of series, uh, with a Hulk kind of series uh, being She Hulk. And uh, they're trying to go for. It sounds like they're trying to go for a Deadpool tone where she breaks the fourth wall. Um, a few times, uh, which will be kind of weird for an MCU character to break the fourth wall like that, uh, kind of like a Deadpool approach. Um, so I don't know. I think I think one thing that MCU has done well without breaking the fourth wall is having the audience participate in conversations. And the best way I can describe an example of that is in spoiler moment. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, if you haven't seen it, spoiler, you've been warned, mm-hmm. um, is when th- when um, uh, when Maguire is talking to Garfield and he's like, no, you are amazing. Like, because we were part of that conversation. Like, you know, we all felt that his movie, that Garfield's movies weren't strong and he's not a great Spider-Man. But the truth is, he is an amazing Spider-Man, all pun intended. Yes, that was a beautiful moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Well, I have faith in that show. And I think they'll do okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I think it's coming soon. So we'll see what happens. But right now, number 19, Ryan. Eternals. It ranked a little higher than I thought it was going to. Uh, I I still, I need to see that movie again. I'm still not sure what I saw and, and why do I think it's good or bad? Like, I don't know. I just don't. That film's a lot to digest is is all I got to say. When people ask me, should I see Eternals? I think actually that's a big that's a big conversation that I've seen. And I, I dare viewers to, to comment on it the same way. 
how do you talk about Marvel or how do you talk about the Eternals to non Marvel fans? How right. do you, how do you present that to them? Cause honestly, I have no idea. Like the, for me, I always say like, Oh, you know, they're kind of like, think of them as space gods. And essentially, you know, they're like, essentially they're like Jesus and they live among you. <laughs> uh, but like, but at the same time is like, anytime someone has seen it they're kind of in this mood of like like what did i just you know what did i just watch you know (laughs) like and what does it mean it's it's funny because this is the second longest mcu movie right clocks in at two hours 30 minutes and it's so strange that such a long runtime was given to a property that nobody was familiar with yet yeah. And to top it all off, after walking out at the end of the movie, I feel like we needed even more time with them. Um I I enjoyed it pretty thoroughly. I thought Eternals was really really cool. I thought that everything they did with the Celestials was exactly what I wanted to see with Celestials and it paved the way for some good Galactus stuff later down the road maybe. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I just liked the team and I liked their interplay and I want to see more of them and what they can do. Um, I feel like, yeah, I don't really know what it is about the movie that people aren't clicking with. I get that it's different. I get that it doesn't feel like an MCU film, but is that really enough for, for all the negativity that's been going around for it? Um, like, mm. does that really merit having it low on people like i i saw somebody else was doing a ranking list on youtube and i didn't watch his video but on the thumbnail it showed that eternals was at the bottom i'm like is that just bias because right now everybody's it's cool to hate on eternals like but like mm-hmm. what does being different really make it bad i don't think so and i'm curious why what is making it bad for some people I agree. Uh, I think, and I think one of the biggest things, I think where my bets were, um, I love using this analogy of, of putting money in spots, you know, just being mm-hmm. like, just so you better understand the the investment I'm putting in these characters, uh, all pun intended. It makes us um, sound like we're more risky and and, uh, and economically wise than we are. In mm-hmm. the meantime, Sounds we're like, like a- $4 for a burger. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's like poker, right? Like it's like you have a hand, you have a hand, you have money on this hand. And then certain cards come out that change the whole game and it makes your winning hand to a losing hand. Like it could that, and that's exactly the kind of analogy I, I love working with. So um, especially in this conversation. So with Eternals, my money was on Dwayne Whitman to have, or Dane Whitman to have, to kind of be the narrative because he is the only connection for us as an audience to kind of understand like we're in the MCU world and you know, there there's been these ancient beings that literally hold us in their hands. Like literally our fate is in their hands. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I was kind of hoping for the story of him to, I, I was hoping that he would be a bigger part of the movie and spend a lot more time with Cersei because that's what happens in the comics is and, and we kind of get a history lesson through a character that's a historic character and kind of play that out. But we didn't get that. We literally got, okay, we're going to learn about the Eternals. We're going to learn by literally spending time with them. And, and, and it wasn't historically, it was done literally just spending time with them. Like, hey, let's go meet. Let's go see what Kong goes up to. Do, 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 do. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? And like, but there's something bad going to happen. Um, so it's just kind of, yeah. It's But I don't know. But in the end, I don't think my, my point still merits any sort of, I don't think my point will merit any sort of reason why it's good or it's bad. I just don't know what's missing in that film in order to make it good. The visuals were great. The cast was awesome. And yeah, the, the, the story was, was interesting, but something is missing. 
Yeah. And I, I can't put my finger on what it could be. I mean, I love everything they did with these characters. I thought the idea to make Icarus the villain was so cool. It was such a brave choice. Mm-hmm. Um, and he made for a much more interesting villain than Crow. So like that just, it, it further cements that this was a risk-taking film. I I feel like this gets a a similar bad rap to Black Widow. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't think it deserves the hate it's getting. And I, I think, I don't know if there are plans to do a sequel or not. That's why it's such an outlier. Like it might just be a one and done thing. I don't even know when they expect these other characters to show up again. But mm-hmm. I just, I feel like the more we get of the Eternals, the better this movie will look in retrospect. You know, actually, I would love to see, I would love to see uh, Chloe Chloe Zhao do another Marvel character. I think the Eternals is a big, big undertaking, and I think even though she really wanted to do it, I I think that she, I think that she should have done something else. Honestly, she probably could have done Captain Marvel. Probably made it really good. Hmm. Not that those directors were bad. I'm just saying, like, I think that. I think that her kind of storytelling would have benefited Captain Marvel a bit more, but I honestly think there's about a thousand other things, a thousand other characters she could have done that would have been really cool to see. But I think she should do another film, but not the sequel to Eternals. I think she should do. I think Eternals should be a one and done. I don't know if we should get another story from them. I just don't, I don't know why. I don't know why you would. Oh, sorry. Hold on. I lost a bit of your audio there. You said you think she should do another film and then what? Uh, I think she should do another film, but I don't think it should be the Eternals. Yeah, I I think um, I think that she is a fantastic director, and I want to see her do more. I'm I'm so curious what they're going to do with those characters. I don't know. I I wish nothing but the best for them, though, because I I want to see what they can what they can pull off and what they can add to the MCU. So mm-hmm. that was number <clears throat> excuse me. Well, that was number nineteen. Number eighteen. Um, another movie that I think is a bit too low, Avengers Age of Ultron. Mm. I But at the same time, you know, you know, we're saying like it's a bit too low <clears> and, you know, this movie's don't know if this movie's good or bad. You have to understand all these movies deserve their spot regardless. They're yeah. all good movies. Like we're not saying like they're super terrible. I mean, I will say Iron Man 3 is where it needs to be. Uh, but at the same time, like we're getting to a point in the list. This is the point I'm trying to make. We're getting to a point in the list where it's like, there's so many good movies that it's just, it, this is where it lands. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, exactly. It's just, I mean, what our, our lowest, like it, it's a B plus at the least when it comes to Marvel. Right. So you're going to get good movies. You just have to mm-hmm. rank them and something's got to be somewhere. So yeah, this is where age of Ultron fell. And uh, I know this is everybody's least favorite Avengers movie. It's also my least favorite Avengers movie. But mm-hmm. again, that's not saying it's crap. That's just saying the other Avengers movies struck a chord in me that this one didn't quite strike. But it still has everything I want in an Avengers movie. It has the beautiful visuals. It has all the colorful characters. It has great action set pieces. It introduces Vision, which I think is a really big deal. We can't overlook that. It introduces Ultron. It brings Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver to the forefront of things. It's um, it's a bigger world builder than Avengers One, and I, I think that it's and, and Ulysses Claw shows up. Like there's so it's so dense, it packs in so much, and I think that it should. I think that in terms of the four Avengers films, yeah, I would put it last, but I think it should be rewatched by people so people can appreciate more the levels of world building that are going on in this movie that is way more dense and way more filled with pockets of the marvel u than the first avengers is and this is like two minutes shorter than the first avengers so it it what i I think what it pulls off is really really good all things considered you know it's interesting too because Honestly, the only two issues I have with this film, and one of them's not even a big issue. It's just I don't know. It just doesn't it doesn't click for me as as much as it does others. Um, 
well, actually, it's all one scene, really, so or one segment. So I'll just talk about it that way. The Barton getaway, the the you know going to the Barton house, that to me kind of broke the film a little bit. But not in, not in like I don't think the scene shouldn't exist. I thought the scene was important in its in its way. Um, it just didn't it didn't resonate didn't resonate well. Um, other than that, I think the film's perfect. I, I I don't I don't think you could have gotten anything better. I don't think you could have gotten anything well. You could always get something worse, but I don't think you could have gotten anything better from that movie. I think it's I think it's a great movie. Like you said, like Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, Vision, uh, Ultron. Oh my god such a scary yes. and intense character i think i think more screen time with him would have been fantastic uh and i like i like he how he talks about when he's in the church and he's like this is the exact center point like explaining that like, that's so good um yeah i think the only thing that wasn't going for it was that barton household moment and i think i think the other big problem i have with this movie is the politics seem to cloud how good this movie really is a lot Ooh. of pol- a lot of nerd politics on this movie. Oh, uh, because Tony Stark built Ultron, and they didn't like that. Well, that was the first because, like, we still weren't used to the idea of them adapting and changing certain things. <clears throat> um, but there was two deleted scenes that could have made the movie infinitely better, and and Whedon's like, they, they're never going to release that, and blah 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 blah. So there is this weird politics to the movie that that could have quote could have made it better. And my argument is, I think the movie is great. If you take away the politics, this is a great film. Is, if you didn't know, if you didn't know those deleted scenes existed, and and, um, yeah, actually no, I'll leave it at that. If you didn't know these deleted scenes existed, and you didn't know about all that stuff, this would have been a solid movie. People would have been really happy with it. Yeah, I think. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think there's a, a longer cut of this movie with more Ultron and more Thor, that would please everybody. Yes. <clears throat> but as it stands... But that's that's but that, that further proves my point, because those yeah. were the two deleted scenes, right? Like, is there, like more Ultron and more Thor? And and to be fair, it's... If that did... If you didn't know that, you, you wouldn't care. You'd be like, this is a great film. Yeah. So, I hope people quit hating on Age of Ultron, because it is, it is worth standing up with the rest of the Avengers films. Mm. Number 17, Ryan, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yep. Great film. Love it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love the comedic tone that it brings. It's so different in the MCU. It's, it's a real lighthearted and fun superhero movie. And it's me. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's, I love the music in it. I love the the fighting is so gorgeous. Oh my god. Yeah. The kitchen fight scene with the wasp is like by far the coolest. Like when she does the flip dodging the knife. Oh my god. Oh, so good. I uh, this is another one where I when it comes to Ant-Man and its sequel, I'm always flip-flopping of which one I like more. And I think what I end up going for is that uh, I think Ant-Man 1 has a better story and Ant-Man 2 has better action. Is the action in Ant-Man 2 like the, this this van chase at the end where the van is shrinking and everybody's trying to get the the lab and the lab is shrunk too. I I love when they get creative like that with what his powers can do. It's a beautiful film and it looks great and all the special effects when they go into the microverse are great. Um it's such great pulpy sci-fi. I love it. Yeah, couldn't agree more, man. Uh, and again, uh, villains were great. New ca- they introduced new characters. It was, it was a fun movie. It's a fun movie. It definitely deserves to be there. It does. And now at number 16, um, Ant-Man, number one. <laughs> and what's interesting <laughs> is uh, there was quite a gap between these two. Ant-Man and the Wasp had 96 points. Ant-Man had 84 points. So there's a decent gap. A lot more people favored Ant-Man 1. I'm just trying to see where I ranked Ant Man the first one. I think I, I definitely ranked Ant Man lower. Yes, a lot lower than Ant Man and the Wasp. I actually, you know, looking at my list, I think I would have changed. I would definitely would have put. I think I would have put Ant Man above Eternals for sure. Um, for some reason, I didn't though. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. I think it's because literally this list. And it, I, you know, 
you guys have to understand if we were to ask you to do the same list, I'm sure you would come to the same hurdles. And I even challenge you. Yeah. You could share the list if you want, or you could just tell us like, if you were to do this list, where your struggles would be. And to me, it started getting to a point. It's like, man, all of these are good. Where do I put it? Um, but yeah, Ant-Man one ranked lower for me, but I'm in, in this final list and why I love this formula you've created so well. Um, I think, it, yeah, I, I, I figure the first Ant-Man does have, if I were to literally compare the two, it has the shock value of, of being the most amazing film that it is. Mm-hmm. Um, because the other thing too, is you have to understand this movie wasn't going to work. It, it literally, you know, they had director issues trying to get it or get a right to build this thing. And it didn't work and the next thing you know they finally find peyton reed has to they had to script doctor the whole thing and then on top of that like they literally they got they got peyton reed and told all the actors okay film's good we're gonna start producing it by the way you have to go to comic-con now and talk about how you're gonna make ant-man and literally they haven't made it yet and so (laughs) this film should not have worked and yet it did yeah, that whole Edgar Wright debacle, I remember that really scaring me because I was so excited. He's He might be my favorite director. Uh, mm-hmm. And when I found out that he was going to do Ant-Man, I was like, yes. And then I found out he was bowing out of Ant-Man because of creative differences. I got afraid because that was the first time. No, this isn't Lucasfilm. That was the first time that we had heard of this happening in the MCU. Yes, so that's right. It was worrying. And I was like, oh, no. And it was around that point where I was getting... You know, it was the thrill of, I can't believe I'm going to see a movie with blank. And we were fresh off Age of Ultron where I was like, I can't believe I'm going to see a movie with Vision. And now going into this, it was, I can't believe I'm going to see a movie with Ant-Man. So that excitement was real. And when I heard about this director swap, I got a little bit afraid. I was like, do they not know what to do with this character? Is he too hard a character to adapt? What's going to happen? And then what we ended up getting was a movie that looked beautiful that had, in my opinion, the handsomest man in the world. And according to People Magazine, also many other people's opinion, the handsomest man in the world playing Ant-Man. Uh, it had great, a great story with him and with Hope and with um, uh, Hank and just like the three of them put in together this job and going up against a, a scary villain. I thought Yellow Jacket was a pretty scary villain. He was creepy and evil in all the right ways. Um And I think what Ant-Man and the Wasp was missing was a decent, memorable villain. Because Ghost, she's great and I love her. Then she ends up not being a villain. So it kind of like, do we count her as a villain at that point? Or is the villain just Walton Goggins? In in which case, our villain is just a guy in a suit with courtly Southern manners. It's like, uh, I don't know. So there's so many merits to these two movies. And I feel like if you took all the best parts from each one and cherry picked them, you would have the perfect Marvel film. And I'm really hoping that's what they do with quantum mania is take all the best parts of Ant-Man and all the best parts of Ant-Man and the wasp, put them together into one mega movie and throw in Kane the conqueror for good measure. <laughs> well, actually I, I gotta say too, one thing Ant-Man had was actually a first big surprise, which was Falcon being in the movie. And That's I don't right. think a lot of people, I don't think a lot of people knew that, which was pretty cool. Yeah, that was a big deal when we saw him show up uh, and to see, it's always great seeing those random little fights between characters, right? So to see Ant-Man versus Falcon, beautiful. Um, I think they're just solid, fun movies, both of these. And I can't wait to see, I, I have a feeling they're going to Ragnarok it with part three. I have a feeling they're going to oh, take everything 100%. and just, it's going to be beyond what we've imagined. So number 15, Ryan, is where things get interesting here. Number 15 is Captain America. Okay. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, mm, mm, uh, oof, where did I rank good old, good old Cap? You ranked um, it pretty high, I remember. Yes, I did. <laughs> that I did, sir. That <clears throat> I did. Um, yes, yes, I ranked it fairly fairly high uh so i'm i'm a little surprised it ranked so middle ground for us um i mean this movie's perfect uh I, honestly i think it's one of the marvel's most perfect films of of great character journey amazing villain uh incredible easter eggs and uh and yeah and also just uh 
you know, bringing out one of the, just one of the best MCU stories and, and one of the biggest risks. This was my, this was my number one film. Yeah. Uh, man, this is my number one film. And you know, what's funny though. If I, if, if no way home was in the list, no way home would be my number one. And then this would be my sequel. Uh, this would be my number two. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised. And the rest of the rest of these rest of you guys definitely messed this up because it shouldn't be as low. <laughs> I can't remember where I had it. I might have had it somewhere around here because here's the thing about Captain America. Um, you've you've recently been reading Ready Player One, right? Mm-hmm. And in Ready Player One, um, whenever you whenever they talk about James Halliday and all the stuff he was into, there's a part where they talk about how James Halliday had what he called the holy trilogies where he had a list of of movies that he called the holy trilogies and they were trilogies that he absolutely loved i have my own list of holy trilogies and i think the captain america trilogy is one of them uh because it's one of the few trilogies in existence that i believe gets better with each movie um i feel that way i love captain america one and then i think it just keeps topping itself and that's so rare the only other trilogy I can think of that did that was like Toy Story and The Dark Knight. Like it's it's so hard to do. So I will sing praises to the Captain America trilogy until my voice is as raw as it sounds like it is right now. But uh, it just, Captain America 1 had to go somewhere. I refuse to call it the first Avenger because we all know it should just be called Captain America. That was just a copyright thing. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I I think this is a decent spot for it around halfway through the list uh but i love it i love it to pieces it's good old nazi punching red skull bashing acts action of the highest order and it has Haley atwell being amazing and it has um what's his face toby jones promising not to get a scratch on red skull's car so yeah and it was it was kind of marvel's first period piece and it was so good it was so good what an incredible risk and it paid off the biggest Good for them. Good for Joe Johnston. And uh, he really, I think he set a high bar for this character. Uh, So that's Captain America. And now we go to number 14, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I actually ranked Volume 2 a bit lower on my list um, because I think that movie is fantastic. The reason why I ranked it lower was because it it was unnecessarily long. I think this was an unnecessarily long film. I'm nothing against I'm nothing against it in that, and that's not a terrible problem to have, like the movie being longer than it needs to be. But to me, it just there's to me it started to feel slow for me, and that that's mm. because it was too long, and that's that's when it gets a problem for me. But other than that, it's the only problem I have with it. It's just too long. It is a long movie. Uh, it's significantly longer than the first one. I think it's like 18 minutes longer or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just feel like when I look at it, I can't find any fat that I would trim. Mm-hmm. Like I can't think of anything where I'm like, yeah, I, I can do without this. Um, it's, it's just more guardians goodness. And I think that it's, I, I also would rank the first one higher, but I think it does beautiful things. It expands the world of guardians in amazing ways uh like i'll i'll never forget the way i felt when i heard that one line that sylvester stallone says when he says there are a hundred ravager clans across the galaxy you just lost the business of 99 of them by serving one that is the kind of world building that i love because i'm like wait a minute there's a hundred of you oh my god what are they like so uh it's it's uh it talk about opening up doorways this movie opens up all the doorways and then some and I think that it, we can't forget how brave it was to end a movie with the death of a major character. And then the movie doesn't end on a big bombastic note. It ends on this quiet, sad note. And I find that ending scene beautiful. I can't watch that ending scene without getting choked up. Uh, it's just, it's the perfect way to end Yondu's story. And to to have that movie just end the way it did, I feel like a lot of superhero movies would be too afraid to end that way. But James Gunn was brave enough to do that. And I have a feeling we're in for more 
uh, of that kind of bittersweetness in volume three. Yeah, I agree. I agree. hundred uh, percent. Like, like I said, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know where I would, I would trim the fat, but I still feel like there's, there's some fat there. Maybe, maybe. And ego better villain than Ronan. Yep. Yeah. Can't deny that. All right. Number 13. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, number 13 and 12 are a tie that I could not break. <sighs> yeah, it was impossible to break. They had the same amount of points and neither of them appeared first more than the other on lists. It was just a, a total tie. So I guess, would you like me to say them both or would you like me to say just one and then we'll talk about one? And yeah, then talk, do one and then we'll talk about the other. All right. So one of them is Black Panther. That's fair. It's perfect. Uh, perf- and again, we're at the point in the list where they're like, these are all great, yeah. amazing films. It's just, where do you put them? Um, Black Panther was amazing. Introduced probably one of the greatest villains uh, and uh, another amazing story. Incredible visuals. A lot of fun. There's literally nothing wrong <laughs> with this film. Nothing. No, it's the script is so good. It's practically Shakespeare. I'll never forget the, the feeling. script is so good. It's practically shit. You could not review a better movie. <laughs> that kind of line. <laughs> Woo. That's it, good. It really good. is. And the feeling you get in the theater when the camera pans up to that waterfall and you hear the, the drums and you see all the different tribes and it's so colorful and beautiful. It's <clears throat> it's everything you want in a, a movie about Wakanda. Um, yep. And I am, I'm still shocked that this movie came out like in 2018 and we haven't seen Wakanda since like, it's such a beautiful place and it was so popular. Like the movie did so well. Like I'm shocked we have not seen Wakanda since then. Uh, so yeah, I have nothing bad to say about black Panther at all. Uh, and I, I don't think I have anything bad to say about the movie that it tied with. And that is, the Avengers. Wow. If, if it were going to tie any other movie. <laughs> uh, geez. Uh, okay. First of all, I, I'm going to final, final, my final thoughts of Black Panther. You know, that movie probably meant the world to so many people. And, and uh, you know, uh, Chadwick, you're going to miss that guy. I'm going to miss him. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just uh, there's <clears throat> literally, there's this, and just to show you, like it tied with the Avengers, like that's huge. Yeah. Um, Avengers to me has a bit of emotional stakes in it, where where the big thing here is that uh, it just I'll, I'll never I'll never forget the excitement, the anticipation, you know, getting all these characters together. Like if you look at the if you look at the promo for this. If you look at the promo for this movie, 90% of what they say is like, this has never been done before, or they have all these different franchises coming together in this one movie. And that's 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 the line for all of their advertising, like yeah. all of it. And just the, the spectacle that was the Avengers is, oh my God. And I'll never forget to, I'll never forget when my brother looked at me after the title card kicked in and he's like, that was just the beginning of the film. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. epic. That's how you open a movie. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, it was something that should not have worked. All the odds were against it. And we were looking forward to it ever since we heard the whispers that Iron Man was going to have a post credit scene where they say Avengers initiative. We, we had all this anticipation, all this buildup. And then finally the day comes and this movie comes out and I think it exceeded every one of my expectations. I could not stop smiling when I watched this movie. Um, mm-hmm. I had it higher on my list than it is here. Like, I absolutely love it. It's the first, and I think still to this day, the only non-Star Wars movie that I went to see in the theater three times. Uh, I just, I could not get enough of it. And um, I I just love everything they did with it. I love how they... They did the impossible. They pulled it off. And to boot, they ended in a way of saying, like, you think that was big? Just wait. Just wait to see what we have in store. 
uh, as a person who grew up with those trading cards, right? Like I recognized Thanos and I was like, oh my God, like I could not believe <laughs> how spoiled we were, we were about to be. So this movie to me, just, it will never not be special. Um, now I know James, for example, uh, ha- actually had Avengers last on his list. He does not care for the Avengers at all. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, it's not a unanimous thing. Avengers has its haters. Um, but I, I couldn't be happier with how this movie turned out. It made the Hulk my favorite Avenger. And uh, it's cemented itself as one of the most important movies ever made. Change the game. I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, Hulk Hulk definitely shined in this film. Man, did he shine. He really took almost took the lead in, yeah. in this this movie. Um, I love the the Hulk versus Thor fight. That is just so much fun. And also, um, I love Cap versus Thor versus Iron Man in the forest. It is yes. so good. Uh, and yeah, I, it's. <clears throat> It's just such a spectacle of a film, and and to kind of getting close to the top top ten of the the list. Ah, wow, what a what a way to start of the, the thing, and whew, yeah, big film, big film, Good big time. film to this day. Still. Oh, and then introduced Thanos, and that yeah. and everyone at the time at the time when everyone was talking about Marvel comics to be like, man, you know, Infinity Gauntlet, you gotta. You gotta read that, man. That's epic. Thanos is such a crazy big character. And then boom, they drop him in the film. Yeah. Well done. Like they they could not have made me more excited for the mm-hmm. MCU. Because it it's so smart too, because it's like you've been building up to this Avengers film. What do you do for an encore? Well, here's what we're gonna do for an encore. Here's this purple fella. Uh what a what a way to go. Yeah. All right, so that was numbers 12 and 13, Avengers and Black Panther, both stellar films. Um, And now we go to number 11, Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the only, only issue, only issue I have with this movie is not even an issue. It's not even a problem. It's just, it's just, if I were to only, if I had to criticize one thing is Kaecilius. I love the Mm. actor. I definitely think it was a waste of using a good actor on a character like Kaecilius. Uh, I I would love to see him play Doc Doom, hundred percent. I think I think he is the Doctor Doom until proven otherwise. Although Cecilian Murphy could play, uh, I think it's Cecilian Murphy could play an amazing Doctor Doom. Uh, but yeah, it was just a weird choice in my humble opinion. Other than that, I I was I I think the biggest memory I have of that was seeing the first set photos. Uh, of Doc Strange, and I was so excited. I was just, I was, I was so ready. Give me Doctor Strange. Oh man, I, I loved this when I watched it. I loved it even more when I rewatched it for Infinity Rewatch. Talk about beautiful world building. Talk about beautiful costumes and great set pieces. It's everything I wanted it to be. I love wizards, and I love everything about the wizard world. Every time you know Mordo says, "This is the spirit of Chung Word." And it comes from the land of high fee. And I'm just like, whoa, tell me more. Uh, I, I love it to pieces. Um, I, I agree. I think that Mads Mikkelsen, I, I don't dislike Kaecilius, but I agree with you. I think he was wasted on Kaecilius. Just cast somebody else in that role. Um, I think if there's one qualm I have with it, it's that I feel like the movie's too short. Uh, it's one of the shortest MCU films. And considering it's such a big, wide world that Doctor Strange inhabits, I just want more. And I'm really hoping Multiverse of Madness is just 19 hours long. Um, I I love every image we've ever seen of Doctor Strange. He just looks perfect. Like they could not have made him look more perfect. So I am, I'm all for anything with Strange in it. And um, I, I think that this is, it could be next to Black Panther, one of the best solo introductory films marvel's made that and iron man and captain america ah well yeah that's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your silence there is like right 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 right, right. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so that's Doctor Strange. And now, Ryan, we're getting to our top 10. Let's do it. <clears throat> our top 10, here we go. Number 10 is... What do you think our number 10 is? I'm going to say Iron Man. It's probably going to be top 10. It's not. Number 10 is... Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Whoa! Okay, okay. All right. I'll run with that. Um, Shang-Chi, eh? Oof. I would say... Well, Shang-Chi wasn't too far off on my list. Um, actually, yeah, I'm surprised that uh, Shang-Chi got as high as it did. Uh, so... Or sorry, I'm surprised Shang-Chi didn't get higher. Um, Song-Chi, yeah, I think definitely a good top 10 entry. Uh, again, another, another great introduction of a character, you know, I think it wholeheartedly deserves where it needs to go. The action in that movie cannot be rivaled. It cannot be rivaled. It was beautiful. And Simu, man, I, I couldn't imagine the intense and rigorous training they put Simu through oh, to get him to where he needed to get to in that. Because I mean, I heard he's I heard he's he's a well trained martial artist, but even in that, like they they put him through the ringer. And I watched I watched the YouTube channel where the 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 stunt crew, um, they they were they were just the they were these guys that are well trained martial artists, and they do all these YouTube videos of fight scenes of all sorts of things, um, and and. And they got to, they were one of their biggest idols was Jackie Chan. So they got to even work with him. So I'm not surprised we saw Jackie Chan esque fight scenes. But, um, but yeah, I, I would say, but saying, but in saying that, the training that they had to go through, I think one of my favorite fight scenes, though, is the, the, the bus fight scene. And surprisingly enough, the, uh, the fight scene when he goes to see his sister. That's a really good. Yeah. Fight scene. Oh, I love that bus. That bus yeah. might be my favorite fight scene in like the MCU. Like it's so well done. It's exactly what you want out of a good fight scene. This, yeah. yeah. Um, Shang Chi takes Marvel and mixes it with martial arts. So, like, I know that's tailor made for you, my friend. Like this, this movie was all Ryan. Yeah. Um, I think I I really loved Shang Chi. Uh, however, of the four movies we got this year, I would put it at the bottom. Uh, and that's not because it did anything wrong. It's just, I think it's... Against Eternals? Oh, you yeah. put it at the yeah. bottom? Yeah, really? I like, I like the Eternals more. Uh. It's Again, it's not... Shang-Chi didn't do anything wrong. It just... It was, it was a very basic movie. It was a very basic, by the numbers, Marvel movie. Like, introduce our hero, introduce his friends, introduce good villain, uh carry on with the world they fight the end like nothing bad all great characters all great scenarios it was just uh, a very i don't know like it's just a very basic cut and dry comic book movie and i think black widow and spider-man and eternals all brought something a bit more interesting to the table uh so i i would just put it last just because of that um mm. But it's a fantastic first outing. I love Simu Liu. That dude is my hero. And I hope he does 12 more of these. Uh, like I, I hope he's all over Marvel because he he rocks. He just flat yeah. out rocks. And I, I, I can't wait to see him just play with other characters. You know what yes. I mean? Like it's just I want to see him, you know, meet up with She-Hulk. I want to see him, you know, hang out with Spider-Man. Like I I I hope, I hope that Simu gets to do the comic book scene where he invents a fighting style for Spider-Man. And that's comics. right. Yeah. I hope so. The team them up with everybody. That's you can't not have fun with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's Shang Chi. And then number nine, speaking of Spider-Man, we've got Spider-Man far from a home. Oh. At number nine. Now this is, this is out of the two or sorry, out of the three. No, I'll say out of the out of the you know before No Way because this is this the list is done before No Way Home. So right. um, we've seen it though, like we've seen No Way Home, but we just felt it would be unfair to just throw it into the mix, and it would be too predictable to yeah. throw it in the mix right and now, and too like, soon uh, to really find a good ranking for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but to me, before No Way Home, this was definitely the best. My my favorite Spider Man 
just because just because of how it played with my feelings, I think is is mm. the best one of the, the 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 most unique things about this film. Because, like I've said when we did the rewatch of it, this film plays with your feelings because they almost had me convinced that Mysterio, there is something about Mysterio that he's here for a good reason. And when they changed it, and like that movie completely 180s, like at the bar scene, and it, and he gets the glasses. It's so good, so good. Uh, so yeah, it, and. I wanted, I've always wanted to see Mysterio done in the movie format. And this could not have been a better time. I think the technology was there to make him, make it look really cool. <laughs> I would love to see, I would dare to challenge Marvel to do a bit more practical effects mixed within Mysterio. But mm. I hope this isn't the last we've seen of Mysterio. Cause I think this, I think there's a lot more you can do with him. I, I have a sad feeling. This is the last we'll see of him. Um, most likely the way the way MCU just tosses villains in the garbage oh, after. No. Uh, hopefully they don't toss Kingpin into that garbage. That uh, he better be still alive, or I'm a riot. Um, I was so happy when they announced Mysterio for this movie, and I think the Mysterio we got is excellent. He's just the right amount of unhinged. He's creepy and weird, and he needs to be. And the movie is kind of weird and off kilter because if you're making a Mysterio movie, it needs to be weird and off kilter. You can't just have a straightforward kind of film. Um, so I think Far From Home did exactly what it needed to, given what it was, what story it was telling. Having said that, I do prefer Homecoming. Um, I just think the the twist in Homecoming was better than this. I think the I liked Vulture as a villain better than I liked Mysterio. Not to say Mysterio was bad. He wasn't. I just liked Vulture better. Um, but I think one thing that I think this Far From Home could have benefited from is I know a lot of people complained in Homecoming that there was too much Iron Man in the world of Spider-Man. And I, I get that. I understand. Um and then Far From Home comes along, though, and it, it feels like they doubled down on that rather than trying to fix it. It's like now the Iron Man stuff is part of the villain as well. Like, mm -hmm. how does Mysterio do what he does? Iron Man drones. Uh, and there's a personal bias for me because I find drones really boring. I put them up there with zombies as the two most boring things that I never want to see in movies again. Uh, if they ever make a movie about zombie drones, you can find me outside the theater heckling them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do enjoy the Watch Dogs games, though, and those games have drones for days. So there we go. Maybe I'm just a big old hypocrite. But I love this film. I think it's a great um, little side story to to Peter Parker and everything he's doing, and it leads into No Way Home so well that it's just a a beautiful springboard and it, it does so much with the character and with it, it strengthens more of him and more of MJ. So all around, it's great. I got very little to say about this in the negative sense. I love me some far from home. Couldn't agree. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I, but like I said, if, if I were to compare it to like homecoming, I'd still say uh, far from home is better. Um, although homecoming does have some, truly truly resonating moments that i that i really love to see in a spider-man film um so yeah but uh yeah it's it's in a great spot and it made it to the top 10 so i'm, I'm happy about that <laughs> well let's go ahead and start comparing it because our next one number eight is spider-man homecoming oh yeah there's there's something i have a lot of beef with our lists comparing it with others i think mm -hmm. you all are wrong <laughs> Um, no, but this is a great, this is a great film. I think they, I, I, again, if this, if you're going to reboot Spider-Man and put him into the MCU, this is the perfect film to do it. Um, and it was, it was everything you, it was, it was everything you wanted in a, I think you wanted in a Spider-Man film. And what I love the most about it is just the unique edge. It brings the MCU film and, and it does it in a couple ways. First of all, it's not it's not a traditional MCU film because it's Sony's character, right. uh, even though it's a Marvel character. 
Um, and the second thing I like about it is most of the music's all contemporary and operatic and all this stuff. And Spider-Man does punk rock, which I yeah. really love. Uh, so I, there's so many cool things about it. Um, and I was a little, I was a little worried about the whole Karen, you know, having the Stark suit kind of thing. Um, even though his suit like looked like the classic Spider-Man suit. Uh, did I, I did I but there are certain things I did like I'm like oh you know what he because if I were to do a Spider-Man in today's world like literally if I wrote Spider-Man if Spider-Man didn't exist and I created him in today's world you know his suit would have like a little camera drone you know in his chest like because because his belt had the flashlight right so how yeah. do you do how do you do those little things um and I like that his, his goggles shrink and open up and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so I think this was a really good modern attempt at Spider-Man. And I I applaud that director, man. This guy, and I love it because what I think is most hilarious is, is like, okay, Spider-Man's been done twice. We're looking to do it a third time. Uh, will And asking a director to do this, this character who's beloved, it's like the pressure is on. So... <laughs> Here's the thing. If he had to do Fantastic Four first, I think it wouldn't have been as bad. And I'll tell you why. Because you could do infinitely better than the Fantastic Four that have, we've been given. Yeah, that's not so a high I, bar. <laughs> this is not a high bar. It's still a bar you have to go above. Uh, but it's not a high bar. Spider-Man, on the other hand, there's been a lot of beloved favorites. You know, <laughs> like the first two Spider-Man movies are pretty good. So... And Spider-Man's a very beloved character, so you have a lot of. Pre- it's like a Batman film. I would, I would have a heart attack if I were a director. If, 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 if the company came to me and said we would like you to do a Batman film, I'd be like, I, 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 I don't know if I could. I, I literally, like, if I was, if I had the skills of a good director, like if I was, if I had the skills of like Denis, for example, from Dune, um, if I had his skills of a director, and someone told me to do a Batman film, I, I would be like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if I could throw even if you throw me like 10 billion dollars or whatever i'd be like i because like it just goes to show you like how the expectation of the fans is would drive you crazy so like look what happened to edgar wright you know like we want you to do an mm-hmm. ant-man film a character that not many people love but still the pressure was on <laughs> so props to this director for taking on this character and coming in with a really cool and creative approach oh his approach I adore Homecoming so much. Um, I think mm-hmm. it might still be my favorite Spider-Man movie. Um, it's just, it's everything I wanted. His costume has never been better in any movie ever. Um, I love the costume at the very end of No Way Home, but uh, you only get it for a couple seconds. And this is the only film in this John Watts trilogy where he's in the red and blue the most. And that's what I want. I, I don't want none of this red and black business. I want the classic red and blue. Uh, and I love the way it looks. Oh my God, do I ever love the way it looks. And the the whole twist with the vulture, like people in the audience were gasping. And it was just a, such a funny movie. I've never been to a Marvel movie where the audience was laughing so much up until that point. It mm-hmm. hit all the right notes for me. Uh, it takes one of my favorite characters of, of Marvel or of the Spider-Man world, at least, which is Aunt May. And it makes her fun. And and it, it uh, does some cool things. I was afraid when they cast Marissa Tomei. I was like, are they just going to go for like cheap stunt casting and be like, it's young, hot Aunt May? Because I love the Tobey Maguire Aunt May. She's just a ray of sunshine to me, right? I love her so much. And so when they cast Marissa Tomei, I was like, what are they going to do with her? But they kept true to Aunt May. They kept true to her being the heart and soul, the one who looks after Peter, uh, you know, at the end of the day the way she raised him is why he wakes up in the morning continuously wanting to do the right thing. It's because of that lady. And even though they made the jokes about how she's this hot mama now, uh, they didn't lose sight of that. And I, I can give them nothing but praise for that. Uh, I love homecoming to pieces. I always will. And the fact that they gave Aunt May almost the only F bomb of the MCU is all the more amazing. God, I love the way that movie ends. So that was number eight. Now we go to number seven, Iron Man. Honestly, 
it's the first. It broke a lot of ground. And props to John Favreau for putting together what was the biggest bet in the <laughs> Marvel's world. It was literally all or nothing and and knocked it out of the park and took a character not a lot of people cared about, you know, <laughs> this and that story, I could read that story a thousand times, like or why even watch that story a thousand times. It was the biggest gamble, and man, did it pay off. What a film. What a film. I mean, I mentioned how The Avengers is one of the most important movies ever made. We we have to give credit where credit is due and put this up there with it. Uh, because this got the ball rolling. And I think it's such a testament that this ended up being number seven, Ryan. It's such a testament to the greatness of this movie because when we do the ranking Star Wars every year, the one that always ends up getting lost in the shuffle in the middle of everything is A New Hope. Because it's the first one. It's the most basic one. It just kind of sets the stage. It's, you know, the most bare bones Star Wars movie. Um, So people tend to overlook it. And when we make our lists and we're like, yeah, well, I love this one and I'm not crazy about that one. Oh, yeah, I have to put a new hope. Uh, we'll put it somewhere in the middle because it always just kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Every other Star mm-hmm. Wars is so much more of an attention stealer. Uh, and the fact that Iron Man can still hold up and still be this high on this list when we have had 26 of these damn things and they're all spectacular. It's a testament to what a great opening chapter but also how well this movie ages and that it doesn't really age at all. It still feels like the first, like it, it's not like when you watch Harry Potter one and it looks like a totally different movie from Harry Potter eight, right? Iron Man one still looks like Endgame, And I think that's really important that they never lost sight. They never, uh, they didn't change too much that the series became unrecognizable from itself. And we owe a lot to just how good they did right out of the gate. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I don't, I don't want to add or, or say anything more than, than that. It's just what you said was quite definitive. So well, let's take a picture, picture time. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I love Obadiah Stain. God damn. All right. Cap uh number six, Captain America, the Civil War. I said that oh. <laughs> Captain America Civil War is number six. Uh I think what I loved about this one the most was the amount of characters that were in it. Oh my god. Um, yeah. you know, props to the Russos for uh for trying to juggle so many characters at once and yet t- still telling the most cohesive story ever um and the character introductions i mean not only do we get spider-man in there we get black panther black panther right just Mm -hmm. in one of the biggest movies right out of the gate and having the and having probably one of the best introduction moments because it becomes his story in civil war and and it's it's so good it's so good um so yeah, I mean, props to the Russos. I love the look of the film. I love the action. I love I love the humor of the film. Uh, the fight scenes are incredible. And you know what the best part is? I'll always go back to look at Civil War because as someone who loves Captain America and loves fight scenes, he has some of the most badass moves in that movie. Like from the from the peak around the pillar to the 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 ricocheting the shield to knock out one dude picking up another dude by the leg and throwing him into another pillar. Like it is the most intense fight scenes I have ever seen in a movie. And yeah, it was just epic. Epic. Oh, it's like I said, this is a holy trilogy for me. It gets better with every movie. Mm-hmm. And I already loved movie one. So by movie three, I'm just like, oh. um, it has so much going for it. Uh, th- this was Avengers 2.5. It really was Avengers 2.5. And the fact that we didn't, we weren't expecting that to happen made it all the more Mm -hmm. bombastic. And like you said, we get Black Panther, we get Spider-Man. They, they found a way at this point. This is the beginning of phase three where they find a way now to say, you know, everybody's done with the origin stories Let's not waste time on those. Now we're going to stick the origin stories in other people's movies 
so that when we get to the Black Panther movie, you have more time to deal with the stuff you want to see, right? You can just mm -hmm. get to the good stuff. Um, and the the fact that we get T'Challa's origin and we get a little bit of Peter's origin, it gives us all the information we need so that you're not going in blind to those characters' movies, but you're also getting that much more of a treat packed into this one. And then on top of all that, you got your Zemo, uh, who, as as you've said many times, can can steal the show as a villain without ever throwing a single punch. Like that can't be overlooked. This has all the hallmarks of a classic blockbuster. Um, I'm actually surprised it's only number six, if we're being entirely honest. Same. But I mean, again, it, we are well past the point in this list now where every single, I, I'd say all of these are almost tied. Yeah. For like, but if we had to put them in a place, I, I'm okay with where it is. Same. Yeah. Civil War is a beautiful motion picture. And I can only hope um, when Captain America 4 comes out with the Falcon, uh, even though he's not Falcon anymore, that it continues the trend of going of surpassing the one before it. Uh, it's a tall order now, but I think they can do it. So now we come to our top five. Ryan, what do you think is number five? Thor Ragnarok. You're exactly right. It's Thor Ragnarok. Whoa. It had to be. Here comes a director that no one was expecting. <laughs> no one was expecting, but everyone was excited to see what he was going to do. Um, and he did not disappoint by any stretch of the imagination. When that trailer came out the first time around, oh my God, every, everyone was just like gripping, you know, like gripping their keyboard, gripping like whatever they can just to be like, ah, like this is going to be so good. Um, and it, I think there's, there's three styles of MCU films that have kind of, or actually maybe four, but like, that kind of like changed the way we look and how we approach Marvel films, costumes and everything. And Ragnarok is definitely one of them. Who man, you can't at this. This is one of those refreshing looks at like, if you're going to do a superhero movie, there is no excuse after seeing this film. Like there's no excuse to make a bad film. And he did it. He did the humor, the fun, but more importantly, the pacing of, of Ragnarok. Oh my God. It is so, so good. And yeah, I'm super happy with, I'm super happy with this film. I mean, for me, I'm a big fan of those 80, 80 sounds and effects and man, they just, they brought, <laughs> they, they brought it in. They brought it in they polished it and made it more modernized than ever. I love that, man. I love what you just said that after the, watching this, there's no excuse to make a bad superhero film. Because you're absolutely right. This is the most batshit insane MCU film there is. I mean, it it starts, the pre-credits is him fighting Satan. Like, it, it's it, that's how they open. That's just their first foot in the door. And he's a giant flame monster and he's got Thor tied up in chains. And then it just keeps getting crazier from there. And by the time we're up on the, the Grand Masters uh, planet, it's like Flash Gordon and it's everything you could ever want and more. Um, talk about swinging and missing and swinging and missing and then a home run. Like Thor just... And the thing, the fact that this was so good, it made everybody want like another and another... Like it, it's supposed to be a Thor trilogy and everybody's like, oh, don't stop at a trilogy, please, because you finally got it right the third time. Uh, let's keep it going. And now not, I'm not only that, not only that Hemsworth was going to clock out after this yeah. film. He was like, I'm going to, I'm done. Like I'm so done with this character. And Taika did such an amazing job that he's like, I, I want to do more. I want to do more Thor as much Thor as I can. Yes. after this. Yeah. That's so exciting. I, I hope, uh, I hope he does a third one with Taika as well. I hope Love and Thunder is not the end. Because um, if we can have a Taika Thor trilogy, just imagine the possibilities there. Um, even if Thor dies in this next one and the third one is just about Jane, whatever, as long as it's as long as she's still Thor and it's still Taika doing what he does best, that would be a hell of a great 
trilogy to make up for the lukewarm two that we got before. Um, I love everything visually about this movie. This movie's visuals are so good that it almost, when I'm watching it, I almost feel depressed because I know like no matter what other movie I watch, it's not going to look as good as this. It's not going to be as colorful as this. Yeah. Like I, I just wish everything looked this nice. Um, and I hope Captain Marvel two learns from this because that color was something sorely lacking from that film. So I hope they learn their lesson and maybe let her wear that glowing neon suit that she turned down. Cause that was a really, really nice suit. Uh, Thor Ragnarok number five, beautiful. Now we come to numbers four and three, which is our last tie unbreakable tie. Uh, so one of those ones is captain America, the winter soldier. And it's funny how I literally left on the note of uh, on the note of like, once you see this movie, you can't, you know, <laughs> there's no way to make a bad film. But, you know, when the Russos came in and did Winter Soldier, I, I was so blown away because I'm like, there is something DC was still doing that made it have more of an edge to it you know like it's kind of like what what the uh what the uh, the 90s uh rock stars of comics did for marvel which was like your uh your jim lee your mcfarlane your eric larson i was talking to my brother about all these artists uh your live fields all those guys you know there wasn't a, an adult edge to it and mm-hmm. and the marvel movies they had really good tones but some of the superhero outfits didn't quite land and the look and feel didn't quite land just yet. And after the Russos did what they did with Winter Soldier, it changed all the looks of the superhero character from there on in. And I mean, you know, yeah, the motorcycle thing, I, you know, the little people are a little bit over that, but not me, man. I mean, if you're going to do a motor, if you're going to do a superhero outfit in today's world, just being, it being just a plain old leotard is not is not going to work. And so how do you make a character, you know, look like their suit is meant to protect them? And and Cap's suit looks very much like it's meant to protect him. Like it's it's gonna, you know, it's got the layer to it and it's got the the bulkiness. It looks like he's wearing football gear, which to me yeah. makes sense. Which to me makes sense because he's going into battle, you know. Football, you're dealing with a guy who's like, you know, 300 pounds and you're not going to wear, a, you know, skin tight leotard. You're going to wear body armor to like absorb some of the, some of the blow. Right. So some of the badass looking characters in that, I mean, Falcon looked awesome. Um, and we got the introduction of Falcon, which was fun. Uh, Widow looked the best she's ever looked in my humble uh-huh. opinion. This is before, before the, the Avengers um, end game. Cause yeah was it endgame yeah it was endgame because i think that was her best outfit and then black widow was just icing on the cake um but yeah characters all look their best and probably the best world building storytelling i mean you know now that i think about it is like thor thor 2 iron man 2 all the most of the sequels all were trying to build the world but cap you know they just they they really just they just really capitalized on like what world building was and to me i'll never forget the amount of excitement and joy when i heard like the the zola Zola algorithm and they're like oh yeah you know we've been tracking all of you guys i'm like oh my god they have and and he starts naming people i'm like oh my god they're naming people and then they drop dr strange i was like "Ah!" like just like face (laughs) melted literally like in indiana jones when the dude's face just melts that's what happened to me when i heard that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in fact what they did literally was open the arc in front of that audience and then just what we saw <laughs> that was the reaction for everybody oh man and just everyone you... had the, the top three reactions of those those main evil dudes that was the that every audience had one of those three reactions right where did you have this on your list oh good question um 
This was number three. Number three. Yeah, this this movie, I can't remember where I had this on mine. Um, I do like Civil War a little bit better, so I had it higher. But my God, this movie is just the Empire Strikes Back of Marvel movies. Um, it's got so much going for it. It's got, it's one of the few superhero movies I can think of, maybe the only one I can think of, where the main villain is just a politician guy in a suit and they somehow make it work and he's threatening and he's memorable and you and he's you robert freaking redford he's my robert teacher said redford. they would never be in a film like that ever you'll never see robert redford and barbara chilcott in those kinds of movies ryan they yeah have better fantasia standards. and i were there he is my witness fantasia is my witness they said it to my face they looked at me in my face and said look man You'll never see great actors like that in a Marvel film. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Who's laughing now, Neil? Exactly. <laughs> well, do I, what I you we... do with your cinnamon. <laughs> I wish Inside we could go joke, back to our funny. college. Yeah, our college professors were were not fans of superhero films, and they they let us know. But uh, we showed them, uh, and I I wish we could. We, we we should just send Neil the Blu-ray of of uh, Winter Soldier. And be like, huh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> we won't even put our names on it, but he'll know it's from us, and he'll know what we're referring to. Um, yeah. yeah, I love Winter Soldier so much, um, and I think that it it's it has something that I love that only a very small number of MCU movies have, which is a cliffhanger ending um not very many do so i really appreciated it when it did that and speaking of which let's talk about the one that it's tied with which is another one with a cliffhanger ending avengers infinity war you know i, I everyone i talked to about this film and again russo's <laughs> oh man russo's instantly became one of my favorite directors of all time like they're like <laughs> what they did with the Marvel movies, just pure genius. Um, like when I look at pioneers of the MCU, you know, in terms of directors, you know, obviously you think of Favreau right away. Like you, you have to, you have yeah. to look at Favreau right away. Um, and you look at Whedon, uh, but to me, like if there was a list of like groundbreaking directors, I would say Favreau first, Russo second, and I would say probably Taika third. Yeah, I can get on board with that. And then it's Guns fourth, list. and then uh, and then Weed in fifth. I think I would put um, John Watts above Whedon. Uh yeah. You know what? I totally forgot. I would definitely put Watts in front of Whedon as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you could see you could already see like that how that list is being built. Like yes. But Russo's, man, definitely number two. Like they, after Favreau, uh, to, to leave the same impact of what Favreau did. Oh, and, and Infinity War is, the, in my mind, the first kind of movie where it's, it's just pure event based. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not your traditional movie. It's, it's an event. You're going, it's like going to a rock concert. You know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not going for any sort of like story or like, you know, you're not coming to uh, for an open mic night of, you know, someone just explaining a story to you. You're going to a rock show and you're, you're there to see a spectacle or like, or actually better yet. It's like, you're going to the Super Bowl. You're going to the yes. Super Bowl. And it's, you're not there to see how the teams got there. Cause you know how the teams got there. Obviously. What you're there to see is who's going to win. And that is, uh, stakes are, that's probably one of my best sports analogies ever. And I don't watch <laughs> that much sports. You're welcome, dad. That's the best I can do on <laughs> sports analogies. But, but seriously, think about it. Like that movie is not a traditional movie. It's a legit an event. You are there. It's the Super Bowl of comic book movies. You are there to see all the players get on that field and do what they do. It is. It really is an event the way that No Way Home was an event. Like there are parts of those movies that are tailor-made to 
elicit a cheer when they come on screen. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you just don't get reactions like you do out of some of these films. And with Infinity War, I had it number one. It's my favorite. It's at the top of my list. I think this is one of the greatest movies ever made, period. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I love Infinity War. Again, I think it it does everything Avengers 1 does, but just times a million. Like it, it's this thing that you've been building up to for years and years. And you're like, how are they going to pull it off and make it work? And then they do. And then they do make it work with all these surprises thrown in. Uh, all these Easter eggs, all this rich stuff going on. Every character gets their moment to shine. You have team ups you've never seen before. You have all uh, your first time with a a, a team of superhero. Uh, sorry, a team of super powered villains, which we have not seen before or since. Come to think of it, which finally made some of these fights a little interesting. Uh, and then you have that ending, and that ending is just there's nothing like it. There's nothing like that ending. Like who would have thought we would have walked into a movie theater and we would have seen a movie where Spider-Man dies. Like who would have thought that, but we saw that movie, Ryan, and it exists now. And I remember sitting there in that theater with you and all the rest of our friends when uh, the credits started to roll and I'm reflecting on what I just saw and I'm reflecting on the snap and what it did and, you know, how it's going to drive the story forward and how the audience was just gasping the whole time and the impact it had. And I'm, I remember sitting there and I just, I had this big smile on my face and I thought the people in charge of DC must be shitting their pants right now. They must, they must have diarrhea coming out of every orifice because how the hell do you even attempt to compete with this? How? Like, how, can't, it can't even, I don't think it can be done. I, it, they tried and it, it wasn't done. <laughs> it, no. it didn't succeed. Because, um, and that's that's disappointing though. With DC, and I think that's why where I feel, what I feel with DC is kind of interesting to me because I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because they arguably had again the best players as the characters they should be you know you have, have gal gadot as uh wonder woman you have ben affleck as the new batman which is a good choice and and, and still mm -hmm. i will still defend to this day the best one of the best choices for batman he um, looks a lot like bruce wayne he does he does and but he brings that i think he brings the most intensity not like Bale does. Like Bale brought a lot of intensity, but I think like I think Affleck brought an earthy intensity to to Bruce Wayne without or to Batman without having to project it as Bale did, right. and that's where I'm trying to get at. Bale projected his intensity, and Affleck didn't have to. Um, and and then you have Henry Cavill as arguably probably one of the best Superman I like physically I've ever seen. Like he's, he looks he embodies the character as well as Reeves did. Um, and and not not to say that Reeves could ever be replaced in terms of if you look at the first two Supermen what he was able to do, but I think he he gets it he he gets it a lot. Um, and honestly, the Justice League film should have been something more than it was. I, mm -hmm. I'm really, really sad by that. Uh, and and then and going back to our Marvel stuff here, <sighs> I agree with you. Like, like Marvel just they are so cemented in what they've done. And until DC can, DC all they have to do is just start simplifying and just start from square one and and get it get it going the right way and just start really grinding it out and they'll get there i i still believe dc will get there but what infinity war did it's and, and they had the top avengers the first one they had to they had yeah. to, to remold and re break all those shock all that shock value and they did it they totally did it they, and, and to top it all off, they made the main character of that film the villain, and he stole the show. 
it's like everything is right about this movie. Every single square millimeter of this film is right. Uh, I, I, I love it. I love it so much. I love you, Infinity War. If it was a real person, I would ask it to marry me. Uh, and it would probably already be taken because it's just so wonderful. Uh, so that was our, our tied spots for three and four, which was Infinity War and the Winter Soldier. We're down to our last two. Number two is Guardians of the Galaxy. That ranked a little higher for me than I thought. I don't know. You guys are broken, man. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Honestly. I was I was pretty surprised that it came. Like, I love it to pieces, but I was really surprised it came this high. A lot of people, I don't think anybody had it um, mm-hmm. lower than like sixth place or something. Yeah. I. But yeah, I think that, uh, or either that or your math is wrong. <laughs> I am bad at math, um, so there's a very real possibility it's wrong. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm really surprised to rank that high. But I will say, like we talked about, you know, when you talk about groundbreaking directors who really reshaped the MCU, Gunn should be pretty high on that list. Um, mm-hmm. Because, again, you once you see Guardians of the Galaxy, like every everyone after that movie wanted a Guardians of the Galaxy movie in their own way. Shape. Yes. And there's nothing more that needs to be said than that. And, and taking care and, you know, just when you thought Feige's like, okay, we're going to take B grade characters. We're going to take Iron Man, Captain America, and all these people. We're going to make an MCU out of that. And guardians were like D grade characters. Like they were pretty low and James Gunn brought them to the top. Like probably one of the most like instantly beloved characters in the MCU is definitely the guardians. So, and like even like what it's done for that, what it's done for that franchise in the comics and video games and stuff like that. Like now, like we live in a world where like one of the best Marvel games out there is that new Guardians of the Galaxy game because because they took definitely they took a lot from Guns' formula. Gun is Guns formula <laughs> and uh, and just made this incredible story and it's super fun. Well, look no further than like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. You had two Marvel Ultimate Alliance games with a ton of characters in both of them. There was not a Guardian to be seen. By the time 3 comes out and these movies are popular, every single Guardian is a playable character. Like yeah. they became, they, they were nothing before. They were just like a footnote in the Marvel history. And now they're so popular because Gunn told their story in an emotional, satisfying, intensely fun, gorgeous, candy colored way. Um, and I've, I've said before on the show, I have never seen a film that felt the most like the books I write than guardians. So I felt like a, a little kindredness going on, uh, after I watched it. Um, I love these characters to pieces. And I think that, um, when part three comes out, unless they really drop the ball on part three, somehow this is going to be another addition to my list of holy trilogies because I think these movies are just grand in every way. Um, and I, I think you're right when you said every person, everybody wanted a Guardians movie after this because it became, it was crazy after Guardians 1, how many other unrelated movies I would watch where there's an action scene and somebody puts on retro music during the action scene and it became almost like ridiculous. I'm like, wow, another movie is doing the Guardians thing? um to the like it felt like wow you people have no other ideas like you're just everybody's ripping off guardians uh i don't know if you saw that movie the charlie Theron movie atomic blonde but it was just like the whole thing was just a really bland action movie and they're like it's a fight scene time to put on a record do do it's like wow okay yeah like uh i just the uh the imitators were strong with this one and imitation imitation is a serious form of flattery so clearly um there is much to be flattered about when it comes to this movie because it hit the nail on the head and i think it's beautiful and it's emotional and it's wonderful and it's got green people and orange people and pink people and that makes me happy so guardians i love you to pieces (laughs) couldn't agree more and now last but not least number one you know what it is it's Endgame, isn't it? It's Endgame. 
That's the only one we haven't talked about yet. It's Endgame. Um, now, I seem to be not in the minority because I think one other person had this, but it seems like most people prefer Endgame to Infinity War, but I don't. I, I have them flip the other way around. It's very close, but mm-hmm. I prefer Infinity War. What about you? I did the same. I put Infinity War above Endgame. Um and and reason is again this is just it's just an argument of like where where do you put them right mm-hmm. um the only thing i will say that it comes out of endgame for me is two things um one is like after that movie is like you sit back and just you sit back and realize like look how far you've come like yeah and what's crazy about this movie is it's, it's literally the sequel to infinity war like literally it's a sequel to infinity war be thinking that infinity war was going to be a one-off like that's it the movie's done you know what i mean like they were done that story but you look at you, you like after that movie my brother and i both had a moment where we talked to each other and we're like that like we literally reflected on the journey that got us there you know what i mean like and it, it was emotional it was a really emotional film um and then the movie itself what I love about it is it's like this constant like beating of like they lost. Then the beginning of the film, they go back to fight again only to lose a second time. (laughs) And then they, and then, then the title card kicks in five years later. They had to marinate with that five years later. I don't think anybody was expecting that time jump. That was a big deal. Yeah. Five years. And, uh, and yeah, and so the way the movie plays with time is really cool. And it's a real shock. And some of the, I think you really get to see in that movie what makes it, I, I see why accumulatively it becomes number one. Because every character in that film peaks. Mm-hmm. Every character hits their peak. You know what I mean? Widow, you know, perfect story about her being, you know, uh, you know, perfect story about her trying to be the Nick Fury and trying to like, you know, trying to look for problems and solving them like constantly. Um, and it just goes to show you how far that kind of paranoid person can go. That's like always trying to see like danger. Uh, Cap trying to be a symbol of hope when all hope is lost. Yeah. Peak. Uh, Iron Man you know uh just failed like just trying to fix everything and failed um and then he ends up being able to fix everything um and then banner couldn't you know has this like disease finally cures it and finds the middle ground uh and thor thor is one of the funniest yet saddest and most depressing characters in that whole film so every character hits this emotional peak uh barton even barton is a character that doesn't have a lot of screen time if you look at in terms of story and everything doesn't get a lot of screen time but um even barton going into like super dark vigilante mode was like a good emotional peak for that character so it's it's a perfect film and it, and in the end you it, like i said it's still an event based film like it's that's the super bowl it's the con, it's like the the con, concluding part of the super bowl yeah it's like and after halftime yeah it's it's definitely after halftime when you realize like okay the stakes are on this is like for a, like the beginning of super bowl you realize it's like this big game and it's going to it's just going to be really you just want to see who wins then you realize like this is the end of the season you know Mm. The, the, the trophy's up for grabs here it's either you make it in history or you don't and that's exactly what this movie does and um yeah it's it's a hell of a journey hell of a journey and and on top of that the final thing i want to talk about with this movie is is like i think i kind of get why these movies now don't have a really cohesive big narrative to go on yet because I think the longer you you play with pushing it out, I think we should be getting somewhere soon where like something needs to happen to start getting this ball rolling in this new phase. Um, but I think what's interesting is because of like 
the 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 consequences of Endgame are still affecting everything. And that just goes to show you how big this movie is. Yeah, you can't you can't have a story like Infinity War and Endgame and then just forget about it later on. Like you have to live with the consequences. You have to have people traumatized by the blip. You have to have people remembering Thanos and what he did. And I love that this movie, even though Thanos has a much smaller role this time, he's still just as scary. Like he never feels like a smaller threat. Um, and he's, he, he, uh, he makes a terrific final boss. He really does. And it takes all the Avengers to fight him, which shows how powerful he is. Um, to piggyback on what you just said about hoping that they, they take their time and build towards something else. I'm curious because this was such an event because this really was build and made as the end of the infinity saga. Um, you know how in the credits here, we got like those big credits where it showed the signatures of the Avengers. Remember that? Yeah. Um, do you think the end of this saga we're in now will have the same thing when we see like Avengers six or whatever? Do you think it'll end with the signatures? Cause I really hope it does. It because if, if, a, if a whole new generation of kids grows up, and their their Avengers are Simu Liu and Tom Holland and Kate Bishop, whatever, um, and Yelena. Like, I want those people's signatures to be on those credits because I feel like that's important and, and you can make that a, a, a recurring tradition. Absolutely. I, I You have to. You, you have to because... The first Avengers, you know, they, what they did for that first saga was amazing. And even even these movies, I'm having those moments. Like what Simu did, like that was the most refreshing take on a Marvel film I have seen in a long time, you know. Um, and seeing Widow introduce, uh, Widow kind of have a pass the torch moment, you know what I mean? Even uh, in this new, in the new saga, because we've seen the pass the torch moment with, um, with Steve and... Uh, sam but you know you have all these big past the moments and now these characters have to carry on that tradition and they're they're the new ones bringing in the new saga so yeah Mm -hmm. i would love to see a title title end credit sequence where they all sign their characters it'd be perfect yeah that would be a beautiful way to cap off every saga i don't know how many sagas they plan on doing but i think that just feels right um Mm -hmm. it would feel off if they didn't do it so here's hope, and, and, and now it's just a matter of what would that Avengers movie be like? How can it have the same impact as an endgame? Um, but endings are hard to do, right? Especially, like, the bigger your story, the harder it is to do an ending. Uh, we learned that from The Rise of Skywalker. Endings are tricky. Uh, very few big film franchises, uh, you know, you ask people which one's their favorite, very few people will say the last movie. So the fact that Endgame was as good as it was and that so many people put it high enough that it ended up number one, that's just, it goes to show what a good job all around, how good these people are, the Russos, the, the cast crew, everybody are at making these films. Uh, it's, it's a real team effort and every, every avenue is considered. So it never feels like anything gets overlooked. Um, I think one of my favorite Marvel moments of all time is... Steve finally getting to dance with Peggy. Uh, and again, what a brave way to end a giant superhero movie just with two people dancing. Like you think about it. I, I don't know what it is. Something about that. When I think about, cause all my students, they're like 11, 12 years old. They love Marvel. I'm just picturing here are all these kids, 11 years old, watching a movie that ends with two people dancing to 1940s music and they love it. I, that just do you know what i mean like i, I can't articulate it but it, just, it feels so against the grain it feels so not what you would imagine but it's so earned that's an earned romance for one see how it works i feel so earned that um you can't help but love it to pieces yep and i yeah no exactly and so I, it definitely 100 percent even though I didn't put it as number one on my list, it 100% deserves to be on, on number one on my 
list for sure. Where, where is it on your list? It's three. It's three. I think I think mine was three as well. It's either three or two. Um, <clears throat> well, that's our list. Oh my god, we did it. We ranked the MCU. Holy cow! Yeah. Uh, so any anything? What, what would you say was the biggest shock of this list, Ryan? Anything shock you? Yeah, it shocked me to see how uh, how low Widow was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my. It would have ranked a little higher than it did. That's um, my big shock as well. Um, especially if you had quick- to do, I don't know if you want to do it, but if you had to do a quick and dirty Disney Plus list, what would it be? Really quick and dirty. Um, just off the top of my head, I think. Uh, are we counting What If? Yes. So I put what if Falcon Winter Soldier, Loki, Hawkeye, WandaVision. Wow. Really quick and dirty. Oh yeah. my God. You ranked Hawkeye higher than Loki. That's yeah. a shock. It's got Christmas. It's got Linda Cardellini. It's, it's got, got Kingpin. It already went. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Once you said, I once I realized Big Willie. Um, <laughs> what about you? What if <laughs> this is where I get stuck? Uh, what if Falcon and the Winter Soldier, WandaVision, Hawkeye, Loki? Okay, that's a good list. I, I I move WandaVision, even though I love Falcon Winter Soldier, I love that story. It is to mm-hmm. me, it is really good. Um the difference is is the shock value that WandaVision brought. Yes. As as a Disney Plus series. That cannot be discredited at all. You cannot make it lower because of what it did. Because we didn't know what to expect with the WandaVision show. And it's still so powerful. When I look back and I think of the moments in there and what causes her to get Westview or whatever it's called to, to make that place. Like, it's such a powerful story. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, that's why I had to put it number one. Like, it's, it delivers an emotional connection with an Avenger character that I didn't quite get with the other shows. It was yeah. just, it was just too, too beautiful to not put a number one. Um, so that's our ranking. You got a little bonus ranking of the shows in there, everybody. Um, I think this was so much fun. Again, I, I have never wanted to do math more than I have these past few weeks when I got these lists. (laughs) Uh, I hope, um, we do this, I think annually on rebel scum with the star Wars movies. Uh, so maybe we'll do this again next year and hopefully we can get on as list. Uh, and maybe even Isabella can make a list and we can shake things up because the more we have, uh, the more uh, interesting the final list becomes. And maybe mm-hmm. we can get some fans to input their lists as well because we started doing that on Rebel Scum as well. And we'll see what can happen with those. And by next year, we'll have three more Marvel movies to add, plus No Way Home. Potentially four, so yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so there we go. So it's going to be a whole new ball game, and maybe we'll even throw in a list of the shows because at that point we'll have like a few more shows under our belt too. So that'll be exciting. So this was just the, This was just the Avengers 1 of our ranking is this big, but you don't even know how much bigger it's going to get. Uh, Ryan, where can people find you when you aren't ranking superhero movies or being awesome? As always, you can find me uh, being on twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada, uh, playing the latest and greatest. And of course you can find me on Twitter, uh, on Twitter at uh, crusader online. And you can find me on Instagram at Ryan J Whitehead. And uh, I got to say, just a quick uh, props out to Jonathan once again for providing some commentary and updates. Uh, we have, we will uh, be, like we said before, going forward with our retake of uh, a rewatch of, uh, of No Way Home and uh, going from there. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. I was actually going to see No Way Home tonight, uh, but now that fell through because I'm a little bit under the weather and I just want to be safer than sorrier. So uh, I'll get to a No Way Home rewatch eventually, and then we'll talk about it on the show because Jonathan's absolutely right. There's so much to take in there. It's a dance movie. Uh, and you can find me uh, right here on the Rebel Scum Podcast Network, as well as on YouTube, Facebook, 
no, not Facebook. Well, yeah, Facebook. You you know the Instagrams, whatever those are called. I'm old. Yeah. Leave me alone. Uh, at Andrew Fantasia, uh, and you can also find me uh, in the over the next few weeks watching the Book of Boba Fett and Cobra Kai season four. Uh, that's going to take over my world for a long, long while. Uh, and until next time, everybody, we hope you have an awesome, safe, happy New Year. May your 2022 make your 2021 look like garbage in comparison. Yes. And please. For the love of God, have a marvelous day. Hey scumbags, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.